So for those of you just joining us, sorry, we had a small Zoom technical difficulty. So we got our panelists uh, set up slightly later than usual. Um, I'm going to be your host today. Uh, Layla Isaac and, and Thomas Nassler are going to help out as well. And let us kick things off. All right, um, we're gonna Sorry. get, oh. Yep. No, I was uh, having trouble with Got the screen it. sharing, so. All right, <laughs> uh, welcome um, to the last event in the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Annual Virtual Meeting this year. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for your participation. Uh, this year, the program consisted of three types of events, uh, kickoff, uh, generative adversarial collaboration workshops, of which today's event is one. We also had a set of keynotes and tutorials uh, bringing to bear interesting new techniques and cutting edge approaches. And we had a contest, um, the Algonauts contest. You can see all of these on the CCN Neuro website. And I ask you to, to consider going and uh, looking at the events you've missed, all of the videos are posted. Today, we're going to have a generative adversarial collaboration kickoff. The generative adversarial collaborations are a part of the CCN program that we launched last year. And the basic idea is that science benefits from alternative ideas and theories. In fact, often we're supposed to have debates and discussions, but the problem is we often don't get together to actually discuss these differences in person. So this is where GACs come into play. We want researchers to come together who have alternative theories or alternative interpretations of data or where they believe experiments don't align and try to understand what could be done to resolve terminological, theoretical, or experimental differences. And then doing this, they can disambiguate theories, proposals, and try to figure out what could be done because in the end, bringing people together and allowing them to determine where the true tensions lie in theories will allow us to design better experiments or perhaps to modify theories to uh, remove these incompatibilities. And of course, healthy, friendly, collaborative discussions are great, but it's even better when you have good, healthy disagreements. So we think this is a great benefit for the CCN community. This is all open and public. This workshop is part of it. We invite you to participate. Please ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Um, the hosts of this GAC will probably invite you to speak at various times if you have questions and later there's going to be a big open discussion for the community to get involved where you can join in and participate uh, in the debate yourself. And if you're really interested in this, we'd like you to get involved. There's ongoing GACs from a number of other uh, groups and this one as well. They're all interested in your feedback. You can look at the videos, you can message them. Um, the more people, the merrier. And we're hoping that these provide really a way of helping to move science forward in a new, more organized, collaborative way where tensions can actually be resolved. And the whole process is supposed to be fully transparent. So everybody is doing um, these workshops in the open with open discussions, there's open position papers, and the results are going to be published in open access, uh, the Journal of Neurons, Behavioral Data Analysis and Theory. Uh, there's a special issue uh, for the last year's groups. Um, and there's also the, the 2020 materials. You, you can see the updates from the 2020 GACs. Uh, it was a video. Uh, posted following the update meeting, which was uh, a couple of weeks ago. So please go check out the ones from last year. And let's make this a success. Please uh, join in the chat. Remember when you chat, please select everybody. Otherwise, your messages will only go to us, the hosts and panelists. We'd like to have everybody involved in the discussion where you can see it. And if you have questions during the Q&A, please remember to raise your hand and we will call on you. At this point, I'm going to uh, hand it over to this uh, generative adversarial collaboration, and I believe Richard is going to kick it off. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
All right, thank you, Eric. Um, welcome everyone to our GAC on the topic of what makes representations useful. So just to kick us off, um, the uh, concept of representations, the topic of representations is quite a big one. So in an effort to drill down into something that we can sink our teeth into for this GAC, um, we found that the concept of usefulness, what makes a representation useful, is a really interesting question that lives at the intersection of these different fields of neuroscience, machine learning, and philosophy. So representations and usefulness. As I just said, representations are this really central concept in all three fields. And we are narrowing our focus today to this question of what makes representations useful. And we're going to further subdivide that into two questions. The first one is, what is useful content to represent? So what sort of things should an agent represent? And how does our understanding of representational content derive from how that representation is used? And the sub second subtopic will be useful form. So how, you know, provided a certain representational content, how should it be formatted? Um, we're going to operate off of a shared and somewhat simplified picture of an agent living and interacting with the world. This agent has senses, uh, processes information through some internal states, acts in the world, and the world contains a variety of different objects that are interactive and rewarding, or um, et cetera. Now, the notion of usefulness ap appears in many different ways in a picture like this, and we're going to hear a variety of um, different perspectives on the topic of usefulness that map to different parts of this picture. There's a sense of usefulness in which representations are useful when they lead to reward, in the world that, that can be sort of stated um, agnostic to how sensory processing happens. Likewise, there are notions of usefulness, such as perception that encodes the state of the world that is somewhat ag agnostic to the particular actions or interactions with the world. One can focus just on the internal state and look at representations that are useful for or facilitate computation, or in the other direction, perhaps representations that facilitate learning. And finally, there are some who would um, say that representations are inextricable from the full system, that you really need to take a holistic view of the agent, the world, and all the, the full loop here in order to understand um, the nature of representation. So hi, here's a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm Ben, Richard and I are co-organizing this GAC. So we are both postdocs in Conrad Cording's Neuro Lab. And as you can see from this little Venn diagram, um, all of us are sort of towards one or another intersection of these different fields. And so I'm coming from a PhD in philosophy, now in a neuro lab, gaining expertise in these other fields. And so, you know, we thought this would be a good group to come together and, and try to meld these different perspectives and see where there are overlaps and controversies and what we can learn from each other. So these are all the people that you're gonna hear from either in the course of the next two sections um, or in the open discussion to follow. So what is this actually going to look like? Oops, that's previous slide. Why is this? Okay. Um, so here's the outline of how this is going to go. For the next hour, we're going to hear from each of the three fields about the content. So we're going to talk about useful content from the perspective of philosophy and then from neuroscience and then from ML. And then we're going to go back to the top and talk about useful forms. Um, I'm being told that I'm invisible, but if you all can hear me, perhaps that's okay. I can see me, so that's odd. Um, well, someone can fill me in about that. Okay, it looks like we're, we're okay. Um, so, as I said, here's the outline. We're going to do useful content to start each of the three disciplines. Then we'll move on. We'll have a break in between. Each discipline, representatives from each, each discipline will talk about useful forms. Then we'll take another break and we'll kind of see what we learned, and where those controversies, connections, and blind spots were that we heard in the course of each of those overviews. And so we'll have a panel of discussion. We'll have a panel from people from each discipline um, to talk about that. And as a wrap up, we'll try to look ahead and, and see what paths there are for future research where we can coordinate between the perspectives of these different fields. A brief note about the norms of engagement for this. This should say norms of engagement for adversarial collaboration. So um, we're all here trying to understand this topic together, and we want to assume that and each of us is competent and has the aim of understanding 
competent from their own field at least. And if for some of us, you can see coming from multiple fields. Uh, we want to approach these debates with curiosity and humility. We're here to learn from each other and learning means that we have some things to learn. And so number three, here are more explicitly some of the goals of this group. So we want to share knowledge and ideas across fields. Each of us wants to learn some things um, from experts that have expertise that we don't. We want to identify blind spots in our own usual ways of thinking. And we want to sketch actionable future research directions. And so we encourage the audience to participate. There'll be opportunities for questions and answering after each of the overview sections, brief ones. Those will be aimed at kind of clarifying questions. Um, and then there'll be lots of chances to interact with our panelists when we go to the open discussion portion. So, okay, with that, we're going to jump right in, um, and I'm going to lead us off with the section on useful content from philosophy. So this is essentially going to be an overview of some prominent views from philosophy about how to think about representational content, and particularly views that uh, involve the notion of use. So to start with a bit of vocabulary, um, philosophers commonly distinguish between representational contents and vehicles. So contents first, content is what a representation is of or what it's about. You could say what is represented. Um, and as we said, that's distinguishing form where vehicles are going to come in some kind of specific, specific form. So a vehicle is gonna be a physical or theoretical object that carries that content. Um, example, one example, some patterns of neural activity might be a vehicle for perceptual content, perceptual representations. That's gonna be our kind of paradigm case for a more intuitive person linguistic level. Um, you could think of the string of numbers 2021 or the string of letters that spell 2021 or the two vocalizations you just heard all as different vehicles for representing the same content, i.e. the current year. Something to consider, um, or we might want to consider both the value and the limitations of this kind of comparison with linguistic representations. So for one, um, in this linguistic case, we might think social conventions and social context are essential to specifying the content of these representations and how exactly that works isn't our question here. But we are concerned with how content is specified for the representations in cognitive agents, the idea being that perhaps use is key to answering that question. So let's distinguish two broad approaches in philosophy of investigating representational content, metaphysical and epistemological ones. So metaphysically, we might ask, what is it for something to be a representation? Sorry, I lost my slide here. Um, and what determines its content? And one view, really one family of views on, on this metaphysical side is that content can entail a functional role of representing something for a user. And so the, the content is gonna be determined by what the state is used for. In other words, you could say to be R, to be a representation is to be used as such. And this user might be defined a few ways and a couple common ways are in terms of species re reproduction or a goal oriented, oriented agent. And so a few prominent authors here, um, Milliken has a book in 1984 that she's built on quite a lot um, that's focused on the idea of reproductive lineages in order to derive this notion of function and user. Um, these might be lineages of organisms. That's the case she talks about more. Sometimes she talks about lineages of behavior. And so for her, evolutionary selection uh, is central in her derivation of content. Dretzky, by comparison, although he, he also talks about evolutionary selection, and functional norms might derive from that. Um, he's also interested in learning as a way of deriving content, um, but doesn't offer a highly developed theory of learning. Two philosophers working on these issue, issues in more recent years. Um, these issues often can be put under the heading of a sort of teleosemantic approach, as you see from a couple of the titles there. And so Rosa Cow and Nick, Nicholas Shea are two members of RGAC, and their work links to a lot of contemporary cognitive and neuroscientific work. So you can ask them um, about their views in the open discussion. Ben, I'm not sure which slide we should be seeing here. I'm still seeing metaphysical versus epistemological. Right. So maybe it's not so visible. I'm I'm just commenting on the citations here that I have listed under metaphysical. So I'm still talking about. Okay, good, good. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah, no problem. 
so yeah, putting putting these authors, so Milik and Andretsky were two that influenced my learning about this topic a lot when I was doing my PhD, um, contrasting them a little bit, not diving too much into the more recent teleosemantic literature, because we've got a couple of people to represent that with their expertise later. Switching to the epistemological domain, instead of asking about what it takes for something to be a representation, we might ask, um, how can we tell when something is a representation or that there is a representation and what's needed to provide evidence for one? And so a kind of view here that in invokes use is that we're only justified in positing that a state represents, a state R represents F, we might say, when it would be useful to the user of R to represent F. So this would be to kind of leave aside the metaphysical question um, and just ask about how, how we can tell. A couple of authors who are relevant, you might check out for this sort of view are Frank Ramsey and Francis Egan. I'll note that um, both of these authors kind of pose this as a bit of a problem. So for Ramsey puts it as a job description challenge where there's a job that representations are supposed to perform in order to perform for us epistemologically. And he kind of suggests this job is not met. Um, Francis Egan supports a heuristic value. So the job is met uh, in, in some sense heuristically. Um, and so we're justified in attributing content, but some further epistemic aim is unsatisfied for Egan as well. Okay, so. So when we think about representation in philosophy, it's usually in connection to this notion of intentionality. Um, so the representations of thinking beings are commonly understood to be intentional. Uh, another way is to gloss this notion of intentionality is to say representations are directed at or about things in the world. Paradigmatically, we'd be thinking about some physical object or another agent in the world. A special case might be one's thoughts about one's own thoughts. So representations of other internal states, maybe we can worry about those later. Um, but so let's just think about the classic case of like representing a tree or a door. Um, and we're saying that that is your representation is about a tree, it's about a door, and those are entities in the world outside of you. Something that can be tricky to make sense of intentionality is that intuitive cases of representations can involve contents that are distant or abstract or imaginary or all of the above. So thinking about content in an example like seeing shapes in the clouds um, is a little bit more difficult to work out maybe, and especially if you're trying to derive this content from some kind of notion of use. So that's the kind of case we might wanna think about. Also worth noting that in colloquial terms, the word intentional is more directly associated with action usually. So I might say, I intentionally did that, I meant to do that. Um, this philosopher's term intentionality is a bit more general and is especially supposed to apply to perceptual states. So perceptual states are intentional insofar as they are about or directed at things outside of the agent. It's sometimes said that intentionality is a mark of the mental, is one of these core aspects of mental mentality that we want to understand and have a good theory of. And in, in particular, if we want to have a naturalistic theory of that, then we want to have a naturalistic understanding of intentionality. You can also contrast intentionality that we're interested in here with a sort of derived intentionality that's often associated with artifacts. Um, so like an artifact, like a thermometer, something we've built, might represent temperature, but a normal way of thinking about that is that it represents it in virtue of something about other intentional beings, us who use it. Um, and so that sort of intentionality owes it owes its representational content to ours, which is what we want to understand. Um, another inference you might make from this is that in order to artificially create an intelligent or cognitive being, you would want it to have this mark of the mental, and so it would need to have original intentionality. To further kind of flesh out this notion of intentionality and what's, what makes it puzzling um, is to link it to the problem of error. So we wanna understand mental errors, often philosophers wanna understand cases of like false belief or misperception in terms of misrepresentation. So for instance, one mistakes the shadow of a cloud for that of a flying predator, and one has you know, associated feelings of fear. One represents this as a predator or as danger. And we wanna understand that phenomenology and we wanna understand the resulting behavior as being driven by a misrepresentation of a predator. Um, a couple of citations here, Dretsky's 1986 article just called misrepresentation, 
where he's coming at this, trying to understand knowledge from the, from the frame of epistemology. And so you might phrase that question as, how do we get things right? How do we know things? Just to get the start of that article says, the deeper question is how we get things wrong. And so he tightly links representation to misrepresentation, the idea, idea being that to understand the former means understanding the latter. Um, Dennett is responding to Dretzky and Milliken and Jerry Fodor and others, um, not going in for an ultimate sense of intent of original intentionality. A, a quote from that article from Dennett is that the problem of error impales all and only those who believe in intentional in original intentionality. So this issue of error and um, understanding misrepresentation is really central in how philosophers have tried to understand intentionality naturalistically. So why look to usefulness, um, especially you know, thinking about mis cases of misrepresentation here? Um, there have been plenty of attempts to derive representational content just from informational or causal relations between an inter internal state and some external object. Um, a few examples here, one is really talking about linguistic representations, that stamp paper in 1977, that influences Dretzky's 1981 book, Knowledge and the Flow of Information, which is really a concerted attempt in informational terms to get intentional content right. Um, Dretz, as you saw from one of the earlier slides, Dretzky's 1988, 1988 book and, and other works involve notions of function and evolutionary selection and learning in a way that really puts him more in a teleosemantic camp than an information-based camp. Um, but this book is what it was. And then Fodor's 1999, 1990 explanation of um, content comes in terms of asymmetric causal dependency. So it's very much a causal view. And philosophers who have found this unsatisfying feel that it doesn't capture aboutness, and in particular, it can't explain cases of error. So for example, this misrepresentation case, um, the correlation or, or causal relations between a cloud's shadow and the internal state that we might think is a representation of a predator doesn't seem to answer why it's about a predator. In particular, this, this causal relation here is between a cloud and not a predator. And so um, something more seems to be needed, something to capture this normative structure, the sense in which representations can fall short, they can be misrepresentations. Um, okay, and so I didn't dive into more recent literature that details supports and challenges for use-based approaches to thinking about misrepresentation, using use as a way of going beyond um, cause and information. And so more on that is gonna come in the section on form and, and from Rosa and Nick in our open discussion portion. So the last bit of this, for the last bit of this overview, I just want to think about this notion of the user. Of course, if we're going to appeal to use to make sense of intentional content, useful for who, what is going to be an important pair of questions. And so here are just a range of examples you might broadly think about. Um, so either use by an embodied agent, one of us, maybe a dolphin, maybe an artificial agent. So that's what, that's a picture from Ex Machina. I realized perhaps I should have chosen something that's more obviously artificial. Um, but anyway, you might think about collective agents, um, a collective user, so a species, a colony, a swarm. There's a picture of ants engaged in what looks like a kind of collective goal-oriented activity where you might think the relevant user isn't individual ants. Um, you might think about subsystems, a part of an agent as a user. So the basal ganglia might use representations from other part of the brain. And you might think of a community uh, of scientists, for instance, as users, though this gets a bit away from the individual agent case that we started off thinking about. Just wanted to put all of those on the table as um, users we might want to think about for this. So I think we have maybe a couple minutes if, if we want to do a quick, if there are any clarificatory issues, and um, then we can move on to neuroscience. I didn't have a chance to see any questions in the chat, so someone please remind point those to me if they are there. Oh, is this a good time to voice the, the thing we were just talking about in the chat, Richard? Or should we wait to our open discussion, do you think? Uh, ben technically still has a minute and a half of his time, so let's, let's give him some questions. Okay, so I had asked um, in the chat, you mentioned in the metaphysical view, 
how can we determine if something is <clears throat> used as a representation? Because that was one of the central ideas in the metaphysical view of representations. Um, Rosa had some answers to that that she she posted. Maybe she wants to respond, or maybe you do, Ben, with a different response. So I guess two broad views I kind of briefly characterized was are that something would count as being used if it is used. So you have to identify the user. And so a Millikan-esque view might be that something is used when it's what allows a, a reproductive lineage of the user to continue. Um, and so for Millikan, paradigmatically, the user might be the individual species. But she maybe the uh, funnier case to talk about is behaviors. So she talks about um, the representations of honeybees who represent the distance and direction to honey. And so there she's, you know, perhaps the behavior itself is what's being reproduced and it's being reproduced um, insofar as it's useful. And so that that continuing action, that that behavior being kind of passed down um, again and again, is what determines that it's about the direction and distance of honey. Um, if you were to take a more learning-based approach, uh, what I would think of as a more forward-looking approach, um, you would just consider an embodied agent as the user, an embodied agent who learns and has some learning trajectory for whom you can identify things that uh, behaviors that they are learning towards, and then insofar as a representation is functional towards that learning goal and moves the agent to a better state of performance with respect to that goal, you would count it as being used, um, used to represent whatever it represents in order to move it towards that learning goal. I should have had a more concrete example there, um, but maybe that serves as just like a basic gloss of kind of a backwards looking way of thinking about reproduction, what has allowed this behavior or this organism to, to reproduce itself over and over and over again and um, that being a way of establishing what counts as a user or just identifying the agent, you know, not identifying the agent, just you know it when you see it, we're not reducing what the agent is, the agent is a user um, and what its goals are determine what things are used for. In, in the interest of time, let's move on to the next section the uh, 1B content in neuroscience, and we'll have another block of time for Q&A um, after all three fields have gone. Sounds good. Okay, so I guess this is me. Is that right? <coughs> is that right, Odelia? I'm starting here. That's right. Yeah, okay. So in neuroscience, um, we have a bunch of notions of useful because we have animals that are doing things. And some of these overlap with um, some of the philosophical concepts that we just heard from Ben. Uh, like, you know, ultimately the, the purpose of a brain is to make more brains according to you know, evolution. Um, but then there are more proximal notions of, of useful and task. So, it's a, an important question. So yeah, thanks for going to the next slide. What kind of things do we mean in neuroscience? Well, sometimes these are immediately apparent um, things that we think externally are valuable, like finding food or mating or more mechanistically the release of some neurotransmitter like dopamine, which we just associate with a reward chemical. It's like the ultimate supervisor, um, the ultimate reinforcer. And then there's negative rewards, which are, I mean, useful to avoid them. Uh, so taking actions costs energy. Uh, thinking costs energy. You, you pay a cost for your metabolism. And then, um, as Richard mentioned earlier, there are some things that are not immediately uh, part of those rewards, but are more informative or on the perceptual level. So these could be instrumental in the sense that if you gather information that is useful for future actions and future reward, gathering future rewards. And it could also be that there's an intrinsic um, value or utility of information, which is somehow just part of the, the makeup of a being uh, 
which we could think of as curiosity. You just, you're performing info taxes. You're moving towards information. You're gathering things, not, not because you have any notion in mind that that will help you in the future, although it might, but because you have some drive to do so. And it's interesting to ask, well, how would you know? Uh, I think in all of these cases, how would you know? There's also the fact that some of these external rewards um, can be modulated. And so they can be modulated by some kind of internal state. Uh, if you're sleepy or if you're hungry or if you're thirsty. Um, and so those that means that the reward itself is, or the, the, the utility of something, the usefulness, depends on the brain that is judging the utility, uh, not just from the outside and not independent of what the brain's actions uh, activity is. So all of that stuff that we're talking about is often summarized by some utility function, U of stuff. And then what, the, what that function depends on is, you know, which kind of useful are we talking about? All right, next slide. Uh, so now if you're doing something in the world, like these are not abstract, these are uh, embodied and you're in an environment. So the task itself uh, can provide some notions of what we might think of as useful for an animal when we, when we are not the animal making the statements about utility. So then we have to ask, what is a task? So in neuroscience, again, we have this uh, global view, this Darwinian view of making more brains, so surviving and thriving and reproducing. And then you have the more local view, which is what to do right now, which you often define in a neuroscience experiment as you know, the animal will get some juice if it pushes this button in this situation. Um, and it will, you know, moving will be challenging because we set up some impediments to moving or we make something heavy, et cetera. So the, which values, which aspects of the world actually give you those rewards? Well, that's something that we as neuroscientists try to make ethological. Um, and so the tasks will be, you know, providing utility for different states. Maybe you're navigating. And so when you get to the end of some corridor, you get your reward. So we give location, the state of location in the world, we give that the utility. Uh, but the, the tasks also provide constraints. And a constraint you could think of just as another aspect of utility function. Like if you try to go through a wall, you get an infinite cost right when you hit the wall. You like bang your head on the wall and that's no fun and you don't make it through. Um, yeah, okay, so I think that this is where, Odelia, you're gonna take over. Yes, hi, so um, in addition to tasks and utility, we can also ask about stimuli and how they impact representations and their usefulness. So a classic approach in neuroscience is to present artificial stimuli like bars of light or moving dots and examine the sensitivity of neurons in the brain. And it's important and, and useful for a representation to be perceptually relevant. A compelling example is area MT representing motion direction by virtue of passing the seven criteria listed in Parker and Newsom. So, oh, I did the previous. So in terms of natural stimuli, um, which we encounter in the world, a broad concept is to assume a certain structure of the stimuli um, to fit the model to natural scenes and then to map to neurons. So assuming some structure might imply usefulness. Um, the observed stimuli in the world are generated by latent variables, um, generative models, I guess that was a whole um, previous uh, GAC. And um, although we don't observe it directly, we can consider it st the statistics or image priors and the transformation from the input to the estimated latent variables provide a kind of useful formatting. Okay, so this type of approach has been used um, a lot, especially in early vision. And here's an example. We can look at this zebra and the statistical coordination between center and surround features. And we can make a generative model where local 
variables corresponding to center and surround are modulated by a global uh, mixer variable. Um, in this case, it's multiplicatively resulting in these um, filter activations. And I'm not gonna go into the details here, but intuitively coordination could be across something like contrast or some features within the zebra. And then if we do the inversion, the opposite process and try to estimate these local um, variables corresponding to center and surround, we can link that to nonlinearities, for example, in primary visual cortex. And this process of going from a more dependent to a more independent representation also connects to efficient coding. And, and I wanna point out that here, we're not recovering all the latent variables, only the local ones. And I think this is a topic that will also come out, up later, nuisance variables, what it is that you wanna recover, what you're recovering, what you have access to. And I think this also raises some interesting questions about misrepresentation, at least of artificial stimuli, if you're expecting something in the real world. So instead of representing all the stimulus information, we can represent only what is predictive about the future. For example, um, in this, um, the horse in this old film, um, what the horse will do next. And there's indeed been um, a body of work thinking about um, this prediction of the future and linking that to early visual representations. In addition, um, as a group, we uh, found this paper, uh, Dark Beyond Deep, getting at higher level properties. So, um, what you might want to represent, which arguably might be less well understood in terms of neural computations. For example, this bottle over here has liquid and there might be some physical dynamics and some intent and uh, functionality. We've, we've talked about some of these already. Um, so these might be higher level properties that one would want to represent um, by the brain. So if we have useful content in the world, then the brain has an incentive to learn it. And this should lead to representations with all our favorite um, learning methods, some of which are listed here. And that wraps up the neuro section. I think we can probably take a, a question here, um, and if no one else has one, I'll ask one. Um, Odelia, can I ask you to elaborate on what you said about artificial stimuli and that you, you said that there's potential to talk about representation uh, and misrepresentation? Yeah, I think that, I mean, that could be more a topic for open discussion, but um, for example, um, these models are trained on natural images, on what you expect from natural images, like how things might group together in natural images. And if you um, put up something like the tilt illusion or other types of illusions, they naturally arise um, because the brain is trying to represent something else. Um, so it might, it, it doesn't care about the exact orientation in the center. So you might not call it a misrepresentation. It's really the brain is representing what it's supposed to be representing, but it might come about as a misrepresentation. And I'm curious about um, how philosophy thinks about these things, but that could maybe come up later as well. I had a, a question that um, maybe also could wait till open discussion, but I'll just table it anyway. Um, it came up in what Zach was saying about this kind of global goal of the brain to be making more brains. And maybe this changes depending on whether we're thinking of the brain as a user or something else. But it seems to me that the goal of making more brains and the goal of keeping one brain around, so the goals of reproduction and survival are actually slightly different and can come apart. And that that could have different kind of implications about content. So I wonder, you know, if, if that shows up in, in the neuroscientific frame that you are working from or, or how you kind of think about that contrast. That's a really interesting uh, point. I mean, we, we may well, I mean, it's clear that there are certain cases where the species would benefit from having more altruism and some self-sacrifice. So at the cost of 
some individual survival, although most of the time those goals are aligned. Uh, and there are also clear mechanisms in the brain that favor social bonding. Um, these are like hardwired things that that allow us to potentially act against our own interests, uh, like selfishly construed, but will serve the, the benefit of the species. And so I imagine that there are aspects of the representation of what other people want, which is actually in support of that goal. Okay, great. Alessandro, do you want to take over for the next section? Okay, thanks. So, so uh, for machine learning, uh, well, there is no way I can do an uh, unbiased overview of representation learning and machine learning in 15 minutes or even in a semester class uh, in a university. So what I thought I would do is to give you a more biased view, which I think uh, could encourage uh, more uh, discussion or at least more controversies. And so let's start with this. <clears throat> so what is a representation? I will define what a representation is as any function of the data, which is useful for a task. Now, what is a task, first of all? Well, I'll define a task as a random variable, which I'm trying to predict given the data associated with a falsifiability mechanism. What does this mean? If my task is to predict the stock's prices uh, tomorrow, that is a valid task. It's a random variable, which I'm trying to predict given the current data, so all the past stocks. And it has a falsifiable mechanism. Tomorrow, I can check whether my prediction is correct or not. Survival is a task which I can uh, uh, rephrase as saying, uh, uh, I want to predict what is the action that will give me the maximum reward. Again, I can make the action and check whether I survived or not. That is still a, a falsifiable task. I'm not going to consider a task something which is not falsifiable as uh, uh, my task is to find a good representation of the world. What does good mean if I don't have any way to measure it or to falsify my statement? So uh, <clears throat> this, uh, right now you may not have objection to this, uh, but if you do, uh, please feel free. Uh, to, um, uh, to say them, uh, but toward the end of this part, uh, I believe you may have a disagreement with what I just say here. Uh, coming to the second part, the usefulness. So what useful means that it's informative to the task. And what informative for a task means is, is what I'm going to uh, talk about in the remaining part of, of this short introduction. So uh, first of all, if I define a, a representation like this, even if uh, the uh, definition may seem kind of uh, uh, obvious, uh, it, it already leads to a paradox, uh, which is that uh, the best possible representation of the data for any task uh, is to just have the data themselves. There is no way I can process the data in a way that makes it more informative. Uh, this is the data processing inequality. Every processing I do to the data makes me lose information. So if I want to be maximally useful to solve any task, I should just take the data and leave them alone. But this is the point. There is no organism that we know of that doesn't process the input sensory data in some way. They always represent them in some way that loses a lot of the information. Even in machine learning, where we don't have biological constraints, it's always algorithms that even process the data that tend to give up the best results in the end. So why does it seem that we need to lose a lot of information in order to make the representation useful? Well, one possible answer to the paradox is that high-dimensional data in practice is actually uh, <clears throat> almost impossible to learn by something that we call in machine learning the curse of dimensionality. The number of samples that you need to learn in order to solve a task grows exponentially with the dimension of your representation. So if you use the data themselves, for example, a picture which has uh, uh, like thousand or millions of pixels, then the number of samples will grow with 10 to the thousands and then you will never in your lifetime uh, will able to observe enough samples in order to learn how to do anything with visual data. 
The resolution to this problem is that visual data or any high dimensional data in practice, it's usually intrinsically much lower dimensional, by which I mean that there are a lot of nuisances that affect the data, but are not actually relevant to the task. The subset of the information in the representation, which is actually useful to the task, is much smaller. And extracting the smaller subset through a good representation allows me to actually do something useful with it and learn to it, and so avoid the curse of dimensionality. To make an example of what I just said, let's say that my task is to classify whether a picture contains a dog or not, a binary uh, falsifiable statement. So let's take my input sensory data, this picture of a dog, and let's start to notice that I don't actually need all the pixels of this image or all the colors to do something. Uh, so I can see that this is a dog even if I remove the color. So my first thing will be to drop the color and still I get a useful representation. Then I may notice that I don't need an eye resolution to actually say that this is a dog, so I can lower the resolution. I get a much smaller representation, which is still useful. And then I can finally say, I don't even care about the exact content of the pixel. If I only know the edges, it's pretty clear that it's still a dog. So this is an example of a representation which stays useful for the task. It has all the information that I need to solve the task, but the dimensionality in terms of information of this representation is becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, this, uh, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so there is some interesting trade-off between the minimality of a representation and the usefulness of a representation. If I don't represent anything, it's not useful. Uh, but uh, if I represent too much, it's useful, but then it's too difficult to work with. The trade-off between these two is described as something that we call the information button Lagrangian. So my loss is the sum of the usefulness of the representation and the minimality of the representation. Now, it's very important to notice that this is an arbitrary trade-off that I can achieve in different ways. So, okay. Uh, so there is actually a whole family of, of representations that achieve different trade-offs. So some represent more and lose a little bit of utility. Some represent, uh, sorry, some represent less and lose utility. Some represent more and gain a little bit more utility. And any agent can pick an optimal representation along the Pareto curve of the one that achieves a good trade-off. Now. I told you that I, I care about falsifiability of my statements. And if I just say that I want a minimal representation without telling you exactly how do you actually measure this, it's not going to uh, work for me. So I can actually give you a theorem that says that uh, a, min a, uh, a representation is invariant to all nuisances affecting the data if and only if it is minimal. So an agent is able to ignore all these irrelevant factors only if it minimizes the information content of the representation, which justifies why I'm taking this as my definition of an optimal representation, because I want to ignore irrelevant factors in the data that do not affect my task. <clears throat> okay. Uh, another topic uh, here is whether uh, there is a notion then of what is a universal representation. Because if you think about it, I said that a representation is optimal for a task and I told you how I define this. Uh, but then uh, in practice, I don't have one particular task recognizing cats and dogs. I, I have a lot of tasks. So you may say that I actually want my agent to learn some universal representation of the data. Now, what I'm going to argue here, uh, which um, I, I, I'm not such a strong believer of this uh, <laughs> sentence, but uh, I, I want to uh, throw it there for the sake of discussion. If you don't give me a task, there is no way I can define a good representation. The optimal representation for any task is to just store all the data without processing it. The reason being that my task may very well be tell me the third pixel from the left of the image you received on, on October 15, 2005. So if this is the task, which is a perfectly um, variable task, then uh, the only thing you can do is to store all the pixel values. So, 
Uh, there is also something to say about, well, but I may want to find a good shape of my representation. Maybe I want to represent the world as independent factors, and this would come up again uh, in the uh, form part of this tutorial. And to that, I answer that mathematically, you can always represent any distribution as the outcome of independent factors of variation, like literally, and there is absolutely no semantic value associated to this. So, uh, again, I'm making a stronger statement for the sake of discussion. Uh, that there is much to say about this topic, but uh, it's important to have a falsifiable mechanism before we can define uh, uh, what a good universal representation is. So one way in which I can uh, try to get uh, to the topic of universality without actually having to uh, not talk about the task is to talk about multitask learning. And this is very important in machine learning. The reason why deep learning is actually so popular is not that uh, deep network is such a better model they are, but it's not only because they're such a better model than SVMs or any other machine learning algorithm we had before. The reason why deep networks are so popular right now is that you can train a deep network on a task and learn a representation that you can so you reuse to solve other tasks. The reason this is important is that most of the tasks don't have enough data to actually train a deep network on them. So what we do is we pre-train a network on some task, and then we reuse the representation to solve other tasks, which is known as transfer learning or in general multitask learning. So the question that we have in deep learning, which is very important for any uh, commercial use of deep learning, uh, is that uh, if we have a collection of tasks, which I'm denoting here by uh, y1 to yn, what is a representation that is optimal at the same time for the, for the concatenation of all these tasks at the same time? So the representation will still have to be minimal, but now I don't want a representation which is minimal with respect to one particular task, but it's minimal with respect to all the tasks I may want to solve in the future. And you can show that in this case, there is a well-defined notion of a universal representation for a family of tasks, which relates to finding the latent variables that explain the data. Uh, finally, what I want to conclude uh, is that uh, there are actually two representations in machine learning. Uh, and uh, we sometimes uh, don't talk about the other or sometimes we confuse the two. So I wanted to make uh, some uh, clarity here. What I talked about uh, are, uh, is the representation of what is in front of me right now, which we call the activations of the network, uh, which is something that you can think of as the neuronal uh, uh, um, uh, spikes uh, in uh, a brain. But there is another very important uh, uh, representation, which is the representation of all my past experiences. So, so in uh, uh, machine learning or in deep networks uh, to, uh, in particular, all my past experiences, so, so all that I've seen in the past, it's represented in the weights for the task of being able to do predictions in the future. So we have this duality of representation. The activations is what I see in front of me. The weights are what I've seen in the past. And the very beautiful thing about the deep networks or machine learning in general is that uh, there is a, uh, th these two are entangled in the sense that the weights compute the activation. So the representation of the past is the one that I use to compute the representation of the present. And uh, uh, Talking about the weights, a similar tier of minimality and sufficiency also. Uh, we can talk about a minimal sufficient representation of, of the past data for the task of future inference. And there is a very beautiful result uh, in uh, this, which is the fact based bound. There are other equivalent bounds of which semantically are more or less the same, which tells me that uh, my performance on the future data is upper bounded by. Um, or actually lower bounded by the, uh, my uh, performance on the training set plus how much I memorize the data. So this is kind of, uh, you can think of it as a student uh, trying to study for a test. I want to know what will be the accuracy of the student on the test they will do the next day. Well, if they're able to solve all the uh, exercises uh, problem, then they're going to minimize the training performance. And so this may be a good indicator that they will perform well in the test. 
But if they actually only memorize all the answers without understanding, then this will increase a lot the second memorization term. So their representation of the solution is not minimal anymore because they only memorize a lot of information without learning the essential structure of the data. So this bound basically tells us that in order to perform well in the future, you need to minimize both the sufficiency of the representation, how well it worked in the past, plus the uh, minimality of the representation, how much unnecessary information you're storing, which you could have compressed better. Uh, okay, so this is just what we want to encode. And then uh, one of the main points of machine learning is actually how to encode it, but this will leave it to the next part. And I see that there are a lot of questions in the chat. So, um, but I, I don't know if we have time for question now or we can leave for discussion. So we are a little bit behind. We also started a little late. Um, so why don't we take the next five minutes um potentially one question if anyone wants to put one in the q a otherwise um we had a, a five minute break scheduled for right about now so we can um break and resume and everyone can use the time to ask questions think about what they want to ask later yep and to clarify there's there there will be plenty of time for more in-depth discussion later so, I mean, if we if we want a question, I, I can ask one, or we can or we can uh, break. What do you prefer, Richard? I want to hear Zach's question. Okay, uh, I put it in the chat. But um, when you, Alessandro, when you described mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of this universal uh, task, or mm -hmm. it, it's impossible unless you set up an ensemble of particular tasks that you want. Then you talked about a minimal representation as being one that captures all of the latent variables from the past. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that that's reasonable, but it needs to be augmented to say the variables, the latent variables that are relevant for the future in your ensemble of tasks, as opposed to generically, because there is no universal without any constraints. And so if you put in constraints like this is my task ensemble, then you no longer have information about the past being a minimal representation. It has to be usefulness for the future of that ensemble that gives you a minimal representation. Uh, Do you agree? Okay, so I'm trying to process uh, to see if I understand the uh, question correctly. Uh, I, I think I totally agree, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so I have this ensemble of tasks and I want my representation to be uh, useful. Well, I, technically I always want my representation to be useful in the future. I couldn't care less if my representation was useful in the past. The problem is that I don't know the future, so I need to use the past in order to construct my representation anyway. And so in this sense, uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, bounds that I showed here are what connect the future to the past. The generalization error, so the future is connected to the past loss plus the past minimality. So this is the depth of this connection between future and past. Right, but there and, you have, an impl you have uh, some implied notion of the task ensemble already. Um, exactly. Or is it so, like reconstruction? Uh, it, it sounded to me when you said it that it was reconstruction. Whereas if you have a task, you might throw away certain variables that just won't matter for those tasks, even though you could reconstruct them. It's not reconstruction. So the way I think about it uh, is, I uh, think you're an agent uh, and you're trying to survive in the world. So you have a lot of little tasks to accomplish. Uh, so th th this, you start adding more and more tasks, but at some point uh, you realize that actually the representation that would work for everything is to basically have a representation of the uh, accessibilities of the scene uh, in some sense. So you want to know where are the objects, which objects you can move, uh, how you can interact with the world and so on. So this underlying semantic uh, finger, which is what uh, you can act on or can act on you, will be in most cases a universal representation for all the tasks uh, uh, related to survival. And now the point about this is that uh, even if I add a new tasks, uh, 
this is going to be stable. It's not going to change because at some point I saturate. So, so this is what I mean by the universal representation that I want to get. I see. So you're a, the, the assumption is that you're able to fully compress everything. And if you're able to compress all of the causes, then you'd be able to do absolutely any task. Uh, but if you have a particular subset of tasks, not all possible tasks, but a subset, an ensemble of tasks mm -hmm. that you define a distribution, then you don't need that. You don't necessarily need that representation. That's no longer minimal. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Uh, perfect, correct. The only thing I want to say is that it's not about uh, compressing everything. It's only compressing about what is semantically meaningful for the agent. So. Uh, if I have a complex texture like uh, the, the blades of grass, uh, I don't want to compress the picture of the blade of grass that I see in front of me because that is randomness that I don't care about. I only well, care that implies that a set of tasks. Like, what if you yes. actually want to draw all those blades, and that's part of your that's part of your uh, task ensemble? Then yeah, exactly. So this is why I am against the idea of not specifying an ensemble. But what I think is that uh, you can take an ensemble of tasks uh, such as survival, and there will be a well-defined notion of a minor representation, which is uh, not uh, just learning everything. Yeah, okay, I think we agree. Thanks. Okay. If, if I can uh, say something. So um, I think those, um, sorry. I, I think those discussions become most productive when we can formalize what we're talking about in terms of math and symbols and, and equations. And so one interesting conversation, I think, is to be had about what's the right mathematical framework for formalizing all of this. Would it be something like, um, you know, probability theory, Bayesian decision theory, et cetera? Or um, is it more productive to formalize things in terms of information theory, uh, et cetera? I'm personally partial, some of you know, um, to, you know, uh, thinking about it in terms of Bayesian terms, but I would like to hear what everybody else thinks then, um, whether you think that would be in interesting discussion. Yeah, uh, well, I can start the discussion here. And I, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if I want to say I'm partial to information theory because I'm really not. Uh, if you read the, the beginning of uh, Shannon's paper, Funding Information Theory, it clearly states uh, the uh, data as a meaning. This is not the topic of my information. My information is information for communication. So saying that information, at least in the Shannon sense, is the right tool of formalism to use, it, I don't think it's correct. And there has been a lot of debate in machine learning or whether it's correct or not. And I think that there are so many bugs that came about that it started out that it's correct. We will talk later about different notions of information, which are more useful for machine learning. I also think that at some point, the line between all the different methods blurs a lot. So uh, what I said about minimality could be also interpreted as a minimum description length principle. The minimum description length principle very famously connects to variation inference, uh, famously connects to Kolmogorov algorithmic complexity. Uh, so there are all, all these different frameworks that kind of change the names and the definitions. But I think at some point, the semantic values of all these frameworks tend to agree. And this is why I'm kind of okay with switching between one and the other. But I realize that other people may think that one framework is strictly better than the other. So I'm perfectly good with that. I'd like to add a potentially controversial opinion on top of that, um, which is that, yes, we, we have a number of mathematical frameworks. We have information theory, we have, um, you know, pack learning, we have a variety of things. And in order to reach a point where you can make precise formal statements, you have to make a, generally a large number of assumptions. And I think the nature of what we can hopefully do in here today is, um, is to take a step back and ask what assumptions, what, what, what properties of the world, what properties of this agent system do we care about that we want to formalize into our theories um, more precisely? And, and that's, that's where this discussion about usefulness and content and form can live at a really high level because hopefully ultimately that leads to better operationalized formal assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect, I agree with that to Richard actually. <laughs> okay, can I, sorry. 
in the interest of the GAC, right, mm -hmm. disagreeing, um, may be more productive than trying to agree at this early stage before you even want to formalize things might be to just have different camps commit to one view, let's say the Bayesian <laughs> view or the information theoretic view, you know, formalization or whatever else you can come up with and then see who gets the furthest in a competition kind of thing and then compare what they actually come up with rather than now think, oh, how should I formalize the image on the retina? Should I try to, make, to, try, to try to, you know, compute the information on the image and then follow the information throughout the sensory system? Or should I try to, you know, think about this um, in terms of how it could be related to some other variables or summarized or, you know, whatever generative model, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then maybe have the controversy later. I agree with the fact that this is like the falsifiable thing to do. So let's just uh, get our results and test uh, who's doing better. Uh, um, so what I think is that uh, a lot of the frameworks will have bugs. I don't think there is one that is strictly better than the other. They are better at describing different things and so on. Uh, uh, I think before we reach the exact formalization, uh, there is also a matter of uh, what are we trying to formalize that probably uh, should be discussed. Uh, so, for example, one point of discussion, uh, sorry, I'm resting controversies now instead of later, but uh, one point of discussion that I also want is whether. Uh, many of the quality of the representation that we're describing are actually just the human biases and are not actually intrinsically any good uh, or uh, like uh, any value. Uh, and so before we go to how we formalize, for example, causality, what I want to say is, uh, do, is causality good to be considered, for example, um, regardless of what is the formalization or just causality or uh, human bias? Um, so yeah. But after the initial step, I agree that uh, we can do the final war of our formalisms. Yeah, let's 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 return to the question of problematic biases um, in the controversies, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So we we kind of ate through whatever break time we had there. So if everyone's okay with it, maybe we um, proceed with form. Cool, so we're starting with philosophy, right? Yeah, it's you, Andrew. Did you get the uh, slide resort working? I think I have. Uh, okay, cool. Hi. Uh, so I think the plan is I'm going to talk for a little bit through these slides, and then I'm going to hand things off to Nick, who's going to say a few more general things. So um, when we ask about the form of a representation in philosophy, generally, we are trying to hold fixed the content of a representation and then talk about the vehicles or the, the causal variables that carry that content. So uh, that will hopefully get a little more clear as we go on. Uh, first though, it's maybe helpful to consider uh, why exactly we care about the form of a representation in addition to its content. And if you take a simple example, like say I, I come to your city and you take me to your favorite coffee shop that's six blocks away and you get us there without ever once opening Google Maps, uh, I'm probably going to say that you had a representation of the coffee shop in mind and of its location, and that this is how you managed to get us there. Uh, for some philosophers, uh, Dan Dennett is an example who some of you will be familiar with. Um, all that I'm saying when I say that you represent the location of the coffee shop is that I'm, I'm sort of summarizing your behavior uh, at a very coarse grain. I'm just saying that, well, you'll get to the coffee shop from various locations. Uh, and for most philosophers, this has been very unsatisfying uh, because it seems like when we say that you represent the coffee shop's location and that's how you get us there, we're explaining your behavior. Uh, we're not just summarizing your behavior, we're explaining how it came about, how you brought, out, brought about the, the bit of travel that we're talking about. And that needs more than just contents. It needs the contents to have some kind of vehicle that's in, interacting with uh, or is just in your navigational system. 
And so the question of form is the question of what those vehicles look like. And they can vary on a few different dimensions. Uh, so, here we go. Uh, they can vary on a few different dimensions. Um, for one thing, a very common difference uh, is uh, between compositional vehicles and non-compositional vehicles. So compositional vehicles are something like words in a sentence. Um, if I wanna say there's a cat inside, uh, I am combining the word, the representation cat and the representation is inside into a uh, further or a broader representation of the cat being inside. Uh, that's what it means to have compositional representational vehicles. They can, you have representational vehicles that come together to compose further ones. And this is opposed to the kind of thing that you might think, uh, uh, just take a sort of cartoon example of a neural network that represents or distinguishes between cats and dogs. And then maybe you also train it to distinguish between cats inside and cats outside and dogs inside, dogs outside. You're probably not gonna think that the pattern of activity um, that represents cat inside is composed of a representation of cat and a representation of being inside. It's just a totally different population level activity. Uh, and so that would, in that case, you wouldn't have a compositional representation. Uh, and there have been a lot of arguments in philosophy. I think it's still quite controversial whether human uh, thoughts and human representations are compositional. But one reason that people have thought they are is the structure of uh, a reasoning and logical inference. So I can have a representation or two representations that I use as premises, like um, Socrates is uh, a human being and all human beings are mortal. And then I get the conclusion, uh, Socrates is mortal. And what I do when I go from the premises to the conclusion is I'm actually applying a rule that's defined over the components of the premise representations. I'm applying a rule that says if I have A is an X and all Xs are Y, where all the variables there stand for components of the representations, uh, then I can move to a conclusion that says A is a Y. Uh, so again, this is still fairly controversial, but uh, that's one reason that people have thought that human thought has to have uh, involved compositional vehicles. Another distinction uh, is between symbolic and analog representations. So symbolic representations are like words, they're discrete and separable vehicles, and they tend to have an arbitrary form. So when I say the cat is inside, I can pull the word cat out of that sentence, and it means the same thing. I can put it in a different sentence and it still means the same thing. It just uh, contributes to a different level, different sentence level meaning. And the word cat, it doesn't really matter that it's C-A-T. It could be chat, um, as in French. It could be um, any sequence of letters. We just have to agree that we're going to use it to represent cats. Analog representations, on the other hand, are a little bit more like a portrait. So if in a portrait, if you try to take a part of the portrait out, take a little square of the, um, the person's wearing a green sweater. So you take a little uh, square of the portrait representing that green sweater and take it out and move it somewhere else. It doesn't seem like it's still going to represent anything. Or if you put it into a different portrait, it's not going to represent the same person's sweater. It's going to represent a different thing as green, uh, rightly or wrongly. So um, the content of uh, a vehicle can be dependent on a broader representation of which it's a part. And also in the case of analog representations, you tend not to have an arbitrary form. Uh, so the word cat could be replaced with pretty much anything, but I can't take a portrait of someone and replace it with pretty much anything and say there, now that's the representation. I can represent the person with uh, a word or something like that, but it's a very different thing than representing them with a portrait or then you know, replacing half of the portrait with something else and saying that represents the right half of the person. Uh, that's not a legitimate move with a portrait the way it is with language. So um, this is the, the second distinction. You can have symbolic representations and analog representations. Uh, it's something like the difference between linguistic and, and um, representations and representations that are a little more like pictures. Uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, the local and distributed thing and come back to it at uh, uh, in a moment uh, and move on to a different way that uh, vehicles can vary, um, uh, somewhat overlapping, but nonetheless a different kind of distinction. And that is in how much structure they have or what kind of structure they have. 
So one type of representation is a simple indicator. So if we're robbing a bank together and I say, I'll flash my flashlight if there's a guard in the hall uh, or if a guard comes down the hall, uh, then when I flash my flashlight, I am just indicating the presence of a guard. And if the flashlight doesn't flash, I'm indicating that there is no guard. And there's not a lot of internal structure there, right? The representation is just kind of there or isn't. And what it indicates is that something is there or isn't. On the other hand, you can consider something like a map uh, and just take a, a city map with lines that represent the streets. The maps can get very complicated, but even something like this will, will make the point. Uh, the city, the, the, the maps, sorry, the lines that represent the streets uh, not only represent there being a street there, but by their distance to other lines, they represent the distance between the streets. Uh, by the intersections of the lines, you represent the intersections of the streets. So this is a representation with a lot of internal structure in that it has parts that represent parts of the environment and that the relation of the parts of the representation represents relations in parts of the environment. Uh, much more complicated than a simple indicator representation. And then finally, uh, there is uh, uh, representations can have different computational structures. Uh, and you might, might think of this just as a sort of external structure as opposed to internal structure. So um, representations tend to enter into computations. So say that you have a population vector somewhere in the brain that represents the orientation of a stimulus. Uh, that representation is then taken up in computations that give you a uh, uh, maybe a two-dimensional sketch of a scene or something like that to tell you where all the edges are and where the orientations of those edges in the scene. And so the population vector has to be structured so that it can be taken up into that computation. Another way to put this a little more simply is just to say that if you have a computation that takes in spike uh, rates and output spike rates as representations of something. If you try to rep that, represent that thing with spike timings, you're not gonna be able to use the computational computation on it. Uh, so the computational structure just tells you about the ability of something to take part in computations or the ability of a computation to latch onto that representation and use it. And one, takeaway from this is that when we ask uh, what a representation is used for, part of what we're doing is asking about or constraining the kind of structure it has. So uh, there are kinds of operations that you can use a map for um, that you couldn't use a simple indicator representation for. And that might be why if, if we seem to have kind of behavior that indicates we're using something like a map, that's a reason to think that we're using representations with internal structure rather than just indicators. And of course, knowing what computational structures or what computations a representation enters into uh, tells you a lot about the computational structure that a representation has to have. So I will briefly talk a little bit about uh, abstraction and multiple realizability and then hand off to Nick. Uh, so vehicles can be more or less abstract in many ways. For One is just their physical scale. So you can have a very local representation, just a few neurons that represent something in the environment, or you can have a pattern of activity over an entire neural network that represents something. And they can also be uh, uh, more or less abstract in terms of their functional role. So if you take this, this population activity that represents the orientation of a stimulus, and you have some story about how it enters into computations of further features of the scene. Uh, you can also zoom in on that representation. And it looks like, on, on one story in neuroscience, at least at a very uh, general level, it looks like that population activity is built up out of individual neurons that represent, um, by their spike rates, represent the probability that the stimulus is at their preferred orientation. So that story would be familiar to some of you, but the point here is that you can zoom in on a representation and find often further representations are at a finer level of functional grain. Uh, and this is quite important when you think about things like the brain. Um, and finally, uh, multiple realizability is just the fact that different vehicles can carry the same content, right? So the English word bird and the French word oiseau both mean bird, uh, two very different vehicles carrying the same content. And this means that the form of a representation or a representational vehicle is only in a very loose relationship to the content of the representation. Um, 
there's not, um, you can't move straightforwardly from one to the other. But part of the point of the last few slides has been that there are some interesting connections that it's worth paying attention to. Um, if you know uh, a lot about something's behavior, you may be able to infer the kind of vehicles it has, like um, you do with moving from the fact that we do logical inference to uh, the notion that we have compositional uh, representations. And if you know a lot about the content or the computations uh, a vehicle enters into, you might be able to learn something about its vehicular structure. Uh, okay, so with that, I will hand it off to Nick. Thanks, Andrew. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna try and be as brief as I can. I just want to pick up on two families of points. Um, and I don't have separate slides for these. The first keys into something that's being discussed in the chat and also relates to the point that Andrew's just been making about levels of abstraction. So you could ask the question in a computer, um, are the vehicles ones and noughts or are the vehicles actually the precise levels of voltage in various components? Or you could say the same in the brain, are, are the vehicles um, spikes or are they the transport of particular ions across synapses? But it looks like those are all candidates to be vehicles. So the point I want to make in relation to that is that the answer as to what the right level of abstraction is will depend on two factors. So we've been talking about vehicles as if you could just kind of see the letters on the page and tell what the vehicle is. But um, what counts as a vehicle is going to be relative to two things. One is how it's processed, not considering what it's about, just how it's processed non-semantically. So in the computer example, I take it that, um, and we can see just from the dynamics of the system that there's a whole different little family of voltages that don't make uh, variations of, amongst which don't make any difference to what happens next because none of them are enough to open an AND gate. And then there's another family which variations between which don't make any difference because they're all enough. So there's a way of separating voltages into a relatively short cutoff um, uh, based on the dynamics of a, of a transistor. Uh, so that's a way of sorting potential vehicle types into classes, just looking at the dynamics of the system, not thinking about what it's about. And that's why it, it's, uh, we can describe what's going on in these components in terms of ones and noughts. That's just a kind of simplification for the way that we have um, binned different voltages together based on what's important for the dynamics. And I think the same thing will be true about uh, levels of description in the brain. That's part of what will give you the right uh, level of abstraction. But something that we've been keeping off the page so far in discussing forms um, is the relation between what counts as a vehicle and how things are wired up to things in the world so as to end up representing something or having content. Um, and we saw that very nicely in what Alessandro was just talking about. So what counts as a useful representation isn't something you can just ask in the abstract. You have to look at what range of tasks it's going to be deployed for. So um, the right way of uh, dividing up a system into states won't just depend on its dynamics considered uh, internally, it'll depend on what those dynamics can do, what tasks it's set up to do. Um, and so I think that's going to be generally true of the way that we individuate vehicles, the way that we pick out the things that are carrying content. Um, so those are the two points I wanted to make, the relevance of internal processing to how we pick out vehicles and the relevance of the connections between that processing and things in the world. But then I want to ask two families of questions that I hope will come up in the discussion as, as, as it's ongoing. So one is, um, uh, what's the right notion of useful computation? So sometimes you can see a bit of processing as useful for a whole range of things. Maybe it's doing divisive normalization and you could set that up in, there's a whole family of different problems where it would be useful to take some inputs and perform that computation, we just characterize it mathematically. But I take it that in quite a lot of the things that are going on in machine learning, the transformations that we see are not as general as that. So for example, if you use a convolutional network that um, picks up on the translational invariance of images, it can learn something in its early layers that are very quite generally useful because it works for lots and lots of images, but it's not completely useful. It's not as general as performing a, a mathematical transformation like um, like divisive normalization. So the question is, can we get a handle on the notion of what kinds of transformations between some vehicles and others are useful, or is that always going to be relative to some set of tasks? And then the, the second 
set of questions which I think will certainly come up um, are related to this question of how states relate to the world. The one nice way that states might relate to the world is that uh, you can decode some property you're interested in the world, is this picture a dog, from the states. And if you can decode it linearly, then that's really nice. So, you know, uh, there's been a bit of discussion about this in the chat too, that linear decodability is clearly a nice property. Um, but it also everyone will agree that in order to represent a feature or a property, it doesn't need to be linearly decodable. Um, and also that it's not enough just that the information is extractable in some way, because then, as Alessandra was saying, the, the original data um, is the best representation you can have. So the question that um, uh, I mean, we're interested in philosopher, as philosophers is, um, what's the right um, way of thinking about how to generalize beyond linear decodability to get the right family of uh, uh, relations between some data structure or representation in the world? Um, uh, so it's clearly not just restricted to linear decodability, uh, but what's the right way of going beyond that? Or is, there not, is, that a well, is that not a well-posed question? Is it that it's always gonna be relative to what you want to think of? Um, and related to that, another thing that would be nice in some representation is if, um, uh, so some, let's think of a representation carried by a distributed pattern of activation, either in a machine or a brain. Um, it would be very nice if a bunch of different features were um, orthogonally coded uh, in that representation, or um, slightly weaker, that in some way that they're disentanglable components of the overall activation vector. Um, uh, why is that a good thing? Um, that looks like that's a good thing because of what you can do with the uh, vector in downstream processing, but what's the right way of thinking about uh, the right kind of disentanglability? So clearly coding the different components orthogonally is too strong, uh, what's the right level that we should focus on as the kind of good making feature for representation? So those are the two families of questions. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should um, move on to the next section. So I'm going to <laughs> written down all your questions to return to later, and um, I'll dive into the question of um, how do we think about useful form in neuroscience? So um, at a high level, a lot of the statements about what makes a good neural form in neuroscience comes down to a statement about certain types of constraints or costs. And these constraints or costs can be biological, as in having energetic or metabolic costs, the kinds of things that you can implement with neuroplasticity, evolutionary history, so what, what sort of um, uh, brain structures are available to play with um, to develop the brain, um, certain motifs available at the circuit level, and uh, noise is a, a reality of um, neural coding and, and biological systems. Or you can look at it from a computational perspective and say um, that you know things like channel capacity and in information theoretic terms is a, a limiting factor. Um, some of the things that have already come up about disentanglement and decodability are interesting computational or algorithmic constraints, et cetera. The, the interesting um, duality that exists here that's worth mentioning is that you can often translate between a cost and a constraint. So in many optimization problems, you can say, I would like to maximize utility with a constraint on the cost. And oftentimes that is equivalent to asking a question like, how do I minimize cost while retaining a certain minimum level of function or utility? And you see both of these framings come up. Okay, so to get into some particulars, as I mentioned, um, neural noise is one of the uh, more salient features you see when, for anyone who's looked at neural data, you know that it is quite noisy. Um, so what does that mean for a representational form? Well, there are different perspectives. It could be problematic or it could be useful. So on the side of noise being a problem, there's this idea that the tuning of a set of neurons and the shape of the noise collectively are what determines the information. This is illustrated by this picture over here where I have two sets of neurons, neuron I and neuron J. In both cases, they have the same tuning. In other words, when I go from stimulus A to stimulus B, the mean change is the same, but, and the overall level of noise is the same, the noise entropy is the same, but the particular orientation of the noise can change the signal-to-noise ratio, which means 
when you think about how noise impacts coding, you have to think about this um, balance between the direction of the noise and the direction of the signal. Um, on information theoretic terms, neural noise is often invoked as a way to, in, to say that, um, you know, there's a, in this information theoretic term of having limited capacity. Um, and there's also a perspective that um, noise is a, uh, is not inevitable per se, but it is the result of solving other constraints or costs. For instance, Computing deterministically, in other words, computing without noise, can take more energy than computing with noise. So noise might just be a necessary evil to satisfy energy constraints. Um, on the other hand, there are perspectives where neural noise is useful. For instance, stochastic computation is known to uh, help in solving difficult computational problems. For instance, um, sampling uh, can be used to solve hard inference problems. and um, Stochastic policies can be used to, to solve hard decision-making problems when you have limited resources. Um, having internal noise is also known to regularize learning and increase the robustness of learned representations and help to generalize. Um, to switch gears, um, different neural forms uh, solve different tasks. Um, one example of this is the classic distinction between spike rates and spike timing. Um, these can be used in different contexts. For instance, um, spike timing codes are seen in cases where um, precision on the level of milliseconds matters. For instance, localizing sounds that arrive at the different years on very short time scales. Um, it's known that, you know, uh, that the particular arrival time of spikes is used to do that calculation. Um, rate codes are more useful in cases where you care about um, robustness to noise or chaos. And um, it's also been proposed that using spike-based forms is a, is a potential way to facilitate learning because neurons can um, depend, sort of, by setting a random threshold, see the causal effect of their spike on downstream systems. Um, it's also important to note that different forms can be used to answer different types of questions. So I can use this example over here. This is a picture of a tree and ask two different questions at two different levels of abstraction. So a question like, what is this a picture of? Or a question like, where are the contrast edges in this image? Are questions at different levels of abstraction. And it's, uh, yeah, and, and so using different parts of a representation, for instance, you know, something closer to the image might be more useful to answer the first or the, the yellow question here and using potentially a more abstract form um, that, that picks out the you know, high level features of an image are more useful for the uh, purple highlighted question. Um, I wanna say a few words briefly about the notion of invariance in neuroscience. So there's the sort of first order definition, which is invariance as no change. A classic example of this that might be known by some here is um, phase invariant tuning of complex cells. So if I vary the orientation of a grading stimulus, or I vary the phase of the grading stimulus, there are certain types of neurons that are going to be relatively invariant to the phase. So I change the phase and there's really no change in the response, roughly. A different kind of invariance is an ignorable change. An example of this is contrast invariant tuning. So I can make the same plot for a neuron and look at how it's tuned to orientation, change the contrast and see some um, multiplicative modulation of the tuning curve. And why would this be useful? This is not invariant in the strict sense of being invariant to contrast, but it is, not a, it is a kind of representation that preserves information about both the contrast and the orientation. And it's a kind of representation that has a simple decoder. So if I'm only interested in the orientation, I can just sort of isolate a certain, you know, I don't need to worry about the contrast. So this, this is an interesting idea um, that I, I think, yeah. So the second example of contrast invariant, this ignorable change points to this really interesting idea that having an invariant decoder or a context independent decoder, like if I wanna decode orientation, I can ignore, I don't actually need to know what the contrast is, um, sometimes implies a context dependent or variant encoding. And this is a point that's been made by a few papers that I've cited at the bottom. Um, and yeah, okay. So 
just a quick side note on this notion of preserving information. Um, to, I, I'm going to put an approximation here and say this notion of equivariance exists that is roughly something like um, preserving information about both content and style, however those are defined. And a classic example that some might be familiar with is that the primate ventral stream is thought to represent object identity. And you get to IT, um, uh, which would be something like representing the content, but you know, objects also have a lot of style information. For instance, I can look at this image and say this is an image of an airplane, but also report things about the position of the airplane, the rotation of the airplane, all of these things that would be considered style or nuisance variables. And this um, really interesting paper by Hong et al. in 2016 showed that, in fact, the, what you might consider style variables like position, size, rotation, et cetera, are actually more decodable from IT than they are from earlier areas, suggesting that as you move down the venture stream, you're getting something like an equivariant representation of both content and style. Perhaps a controversial statement to return to, we'll see. Um, okay, uh, and the, the last high level point I wanna make is um, this uh, interesting recent work that looks at balances between the geometry of neural representations and the amount of information they hold when you really start thinking about high dimensions of thousands or tens of thousands of neurons. So potentially uncontroversial statement, the world varies in many ways. And so in order to preserve as much information as possible about the world in general, um, it implies that neural space must be high dimensional. If you had a high dimensional world and low dimensional neural spaces, that would imply that something had been thrown out. But neural representations can be too high dimensional. Why? Because being low dimensional actually helps with uh, smoothness and generalization. So here's a, a nice picture of this. You know, here's a bunch of natural images forming a high dimensional input space. And if you imagine changing an image slightly, moving to a slightly different image, a small change in input space, um, if neurons really cared about, if the brain really cared about retaining information about every little potential change to the input, then you could end up with a neural space that is really sensitive to really small changes and is really spiky and looks like this. On the other hand, if you want things to be smooth, which tends to imply things like more learnable or generalizable representations, you might want or, you know, uh, a neural space to be a more smooth manifold as you make changes to the input. But of course, this one is now throwing away information. So there's some really interesting recent work that has suggests that representations in the brain are all about finding this compromise between both high dimensional and smooth representations, which to provide a cartoony, <laughs> Uh, visualization lives somewhere in between these two. And this has been both observed in brains and already uh, transferred into some neural network work and shown to improve robustness to error serial attacks. Okay, um, Nico, I'll hand it over to you. You're currently muted. muted. Can you hear me now? Great. All right. I um, just want to add a, a, a few wrinkles to the themes that Richard has already talked about. Um, and in particular, on the question how do representational forms relate to neural tuning versus representational geometry? Because these are two important frameworks for describing neural codes that have been explored and somewhat separate literatures, but that are also beginning to, to come together. So when we look at tuning and geometry, in terms of tuning, we think of a, a population of cells and each of the neurons has a tuning curve, a tuning function that describes its response, its expected response as a function of a stimulus parameter, uh, theta. And we can imagine that we have some encoding that is the response pattern for each possible value of theta. And we can think of stimulus orientation as a one, one dimensional example. And let's assume for the moment that the noise is multinormal and zero mean with some covariance sigma. So when we consider the geometry, what we care about is the distances between the patterns corresponding to individual stimuli in the multivariate response space. 
So those distances could be measured by the Euclidean distance, or more generally, if sigma is not the identity, um, by the Mahalanobis distance. And this would give us a distance matrix, which is indexed by the stimuli horizontally and vertically, and tells us how far apart the representational patterns corresponding to any pair of stimuli are. Typically call this the representational dissimilarity matrix, where we use a slightly more general term of dissimilarity um, to include estimators that are not themselves distances, for example, cross-validated estimators of distances. So these are two perspectives on neural codes that have been influential in the literature. Clearly, we can compute the distance matrix from all the tuning curves. So the tuning determines the geometry. However, the geometry does not determine uh, the tuning because we could rigidly rotate this, this manifold in the multivariate response space. And then all the tuning curves would change in complicated ways, but the geometry would stay identical. Let's imagine this um, a little bit more. So here's a case of two neurons that have um, sinusoidal tuning with a 90 degree phase shift. And of course the geometry that we get is that of a circle. And we shift the phase of one of the neurons, we get an ellipse. We can shift it even more for the two tuning curves to be counter phasing. And then we get the, this uh, circular manifold kind of collapsing in on itself. When we make the tuning curves more narrow, we get we elicit less spikes for a stimulus on average, and then this manifold sort of moves toward the origin of the response space. So overall, we, we need less spikes. You can also have cases where uh, the surface, the, the set of response patterns intersects itself. So then uh, around that intersection, it's no longer strictly a manifold. But when we add an additional uh, neuron with uh, a different tuning curve here, we can disentangle that one dimensional um, uh, set of response patterns and then it's a manifold again. When the tuning curves are quite wide, we get these kinds of uh, smooth manifolds uh, of the type that Richard has described for this higher dimensional case of natural images. And when we make the tuning curves very narrow, then we move faster in representational space as we sweep through the values of the stimulus parameter theta. So we have a higher local discriminability of stimuli, greater Fisher information. Um, however, we also um, get a higher dimensionality of the manifold, and we might get confusability here between stimuli that are far away from each other in terms of the stimulus parameter. So here's an alternative um, set of tuning curves that would implement the exact same geometry. All I've done here is inverted the axes for each of the neurons. So now the origin is here in the, uh, the, the upper corner. And um, this is to illustrate that we can change the tuning curves and maintain the same geometry, but that would not necessarily be useful because in this case, um, we, we have a situation where um, the code is very metabolically inefficient. So this would be a bad choice uh, because you would need many more um, spikes to represent these stimuli. So the particular tuning functions chosen to implement a given geometry uh, clearly do matter. The geometry might be a useful summary statistic, but it doesn't capture everything we might care about. One thing that I've mentioned is the metabolic cost, where we might prefer codes with lower metabolic cost, which nestle the given manifold that we think is, is useful into the corner at the origin of the hypercubical response space. Also, we have to consider the fact that the neurons have a limited range of responses from zero to some maximum of firing rate. If this were the same for all the neurons. We'd have this hypercubical response space and the optimal neural geometry may not fit into that hypercube in all orientations. And then finally, we have to consider 
the encoding computations. So the encoding may be easier to compute or to learn for certain tuning functions and the decoding computation. So downstream regions reading the code may be better served by certain sets of tuning functions than by, by other sets. And so th th this is all about the features of the particular set of tuning functions chosen to implement some geometry. And I consider that an aspect of form. And here we have examples of how um, that form might be more or less useful. We can also think about this more generally and include features of the geometry. So the geometry captures the information content of the code, but it also captures a lot of information about the format of the code. For example, from given just the geometry, we can predict which dichotomies would be linearly separable and which things could be read out also with other nonlinear decoders, such as a radial basis function uh, readout mechanism. So we could think of um, forms and useful features that these forms might afford us. Uh, so aspects of form could be category clusters, which will be a function of the geometry G, um, having separate sets of neurons for different variables. So it's a localization into different sets of neurons of the variables we care about, having orthogonal dimensions, as Nick mentioned, um, or more weakly, just having a linear decomposition into dimensions that are not necessarily orthogonal. Or we could have this case that uh, Richard showed where um, the, the points representing the stimuli are in general position and we have this very complex code that has high capacity but is not incredibly structured. And then for each of these, we could ask, um, what are their features in terms of encodability and decodability? And each of these could be split into different, um, different subsections. For decodability, for example, we could ask, about out of distribution generalization, about data efficient learnability and about the capacity. And when I tried to fill this in, I you know, made some intuitive choices here that I uh, don't feel very confident in at all because important thing to remember here is that um, how we judge this depends a lot on the priors that we assume for the encoder and the decoder. And this prior, these priors should capture what encoding and decoding solutions uh, we think are accessible to the brain. That's all. Great, so I guess we've got um, one more overview and then we probably should stop for a break um, and uh, then we'll come back and discuss. So next up, we've got useful forms from the machine learning perspective. Okay. Sounds good. <clears throat> okay, so actually I'm very happy that I can answer a lot of the questions in the chat uh, or at least address some of the points uh, with this part. So let's see, uh, we've seen, okay. Uh, we've seen what we want to encode, all the information that's useful for a task. Uh, there is still the point of how to encode it, uh, which is where everything becomes so much more interesting uh, and unclear. So first of all, why do we want to encode something in a particular way? Well, because the way I encode things actually bias my learning process and may make it easier to learn particular things or may reduce the sampling complexity of uh, what I need to learn. So it is indeed generally good to find a good form to represent the important information for the task. Now, the question is what makes a form good? And there is no single answer, so I'll just uh, do an overview of the main ones that we have in machine learning. I think the single most important possible uh, <clears throat> Uh, notion of form comes from uh, uh, mathematics, uh, from group theory, and it's the theory of effective variance and invariance. And here, uh, as actually was mentioned in the chat, uh, I need to be a little bit more precise than uh, Richard in defining what uh, equivalence means. 
So we live in a 3D space, which has a certain symmetries, which has certain rules about how objects move and rotate and how we compose, uh, we compose the different movements. And it seems uh, a priori that it would be a good idea that our representation of the, worlds, uh, of the world should be compatible with the 3D geometry of the world. In particular, there are two main things that one can think of. I may want to be equivariant to changes in the world or invariant to changes in the world. What does this mean? Uh, let's start with invariance, which is actually the easier. If I'm trying to um, represent a cat in my brain or in my network, if the cat rotates, it, it is still a cat. So I don't want my representation of the cat to change. And so I would say that my representation is invariant if it doesn't change when I act on the 3D world and I rotate the cat. Um, equivalence means that if I act on the world and I rotate the cat, my representation changes in the in a in a way which is related to the change in the world. So in some sense, if I rotate the cat, my representation rotates. Doesn't need to be an actual uh, like physical rotation. It needs to be uh, uh, something that corresponds with the rotation in the world and it's compatible with that. Meaning for example, that if I uh, translate the cat and then I rotate it, or if I rotate the cat and then I translate it, the result in the representation is going to be the same or generally that uh, the, the compositionality of my actions on the world is also respected on, in my representation. So, and why this is helpful? Because, well, maybe I want to know where the lion is and, uh, okay, it's good to know that it's always going to be a lion, but I also want to know where it is and I want this representation of the position to be compatible with the 3D world. Okay, so these are invariants and equivalents and now uh, this, I want to make it clear, invariance is a particular case of equivalence because in, uh, equivalence means that uh, representation changes in a predictable way when the world changes. If they don't change, that perfectly satisfies the definition of equivalence. And so it's actually a particular case and they're not like complete opposites. Why is this important? Because it's actually incredibly deep. Uh, difficult to, to learn an invariant representation. Think that you have never seen a cat and now you're trying to find this representation which stay constant no matter what the cat is going to do. That's a pretty difficult task. So what actually uh, we do is to first learn an equivariant representation of the task uh, of the cat and then we make it more and more invariant as time goes on. Which is, means that uh, when we construct a deep neural network, for example, uh, the way we design it is to first uh, make it able to learn equivalent representations very easily. And then uh, we lay, leave it uh, to the network uh, to learn invariance because that is the easier part. And coming to how do we learn an equivalent representation, there is this very important theorem, not too difficult to prove actually, that says that uh, at least if we restrict uh, to linear operations on the data, the only linear operation which is equivalent for a group action, so for uh, a group action, I mean uh, geometry, if you don't know group theory, like a geometric movement uh, on the object, then uh, the only linear uh, operation which is uh, equivalent to the group action are group convolutions. In particular, in the case of translations, which is the most basic uh, geometric operation, then the only equivalent the only operation equivalent of translations are the uh, 2D convolutions, which is why convolutional neural networks are constructed by composing convolutions over and over again until we get the result. They are by design uh, uh, equivalent, translation equivalent operator. And then they learn the invariance by themselves, but we don't need to uh, worry too much about that. Uh, so this is like, one very important thing about formal, we need to enforce this. And this was one of the reasons why we were able to make deep networks work. More recently, it has been shown that if you have uh, 10 or 100 uh, times more data, then you can actually train a network without enforcing translation equivalence and the network will learn it by itself. But uh, it's by far much easier if you enforce it uh, directly in the architecture of the network. 
Okay, so one form is geometry and it's equivariance and invariance. So now the other uh, uh, kind of form that we care about, uh, which actually was mentioned also before, is compositionality. So if I, told, if I tell you go and find a blue large cherry, you won't have a problem with doing this, even if you have never ever seen a blue cherry in your life. So you don't actually need any samples to be able to solve this task. Why is that? Well, uh, because uh, your representation of a uh, cherry presumably is decomposed in independent parts, which are the color, the size, and the shape. And uh, you are able to change each part independently and imagine what the result will be. And you have learned every part independently. So even if you have never seen a large uh, blue cherry, you have seen so blue objects in the past. And because of this, you learn about colors and you're able to reuse this by compositionality of the representation. This is one important way in which we can mitigate the curse of dimensionality because if we can learn all the uh, uh, factors independently and then recombine them to solve uh, exponentially more tasks, we are very happy from a simple complexity point of view. Now, this is the uh, nice intuitive view. In fact, the compositionality of a representation is a nightmare to formalize in practice. And I, I'm not aware of any uh, framework that formalizes uh, this notion without any uh, uh, problem. Uh, the notion that is perhaps the most uh, uh, popular is some form of disentanglement. So by disentanglement, we mean that the, uh, we have an internal representation, think of it as a vector, and each component of the vector is going to represent a independent latent component of the data, whatever that means. And then I'm able to act on each one of these. So, so for example, in this simple 2D shape example, uh, you encode each image as being a position, a size, a rotation, a shape, and color of the object. And the task will be to recover this in an un unsupervised way. Now, here there is again a problem of falsifiability of this. What does it mean that I'm learning independent factors of variation? As I was saying, yeah, you can always find independent factors of variation that explains your data and have no semantic value whatsoever. So, intrinsic in the uh, definition of this entanglement is that uh, uh, the factors of variation that they find are not just independent, they are semantically meaningful factors of variation. And, uh, uh, so I, I don't know, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, framework that is able to define what actually it means for the factors to be semantic. If it is connected with the action of a group and it's more geometric, like the position and the shape, then there is a clear definition of independent factors of variation and of semantic. But for example, if there is no group acting, I don't know how to define uh, uh, the independence of the factors. So I want to make an example of this, uh, which may be, uh, could be helpful. Think about disentangling colors. So, uh, I can say that uh, the independent factors justifying a color are the red, the green, and blue value. And the reason why I say this is that my eyes has three independent photoreceptors, so which are red, green, and blue. And so it's obvious that I should disentangle them like that. Or I could say that the color should be decomposed as uh, U value and uh, 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 saturation, which makes perfect sense. The value is the intensity of the light, the U is the color, and the saturation, sorry, the saturation, I don't know how to define it. Um, but that is a perfectly valid uh, independent factor just to find the color. So, which one of these two is better? I have no falsifiability mechanism. And if I don't have any uh, a priori semantic, I wouldn't know how to define which one is better. Uh, the, I don't have a slide on that, but there was uh, the uh, notion of uh, causality also. One definition of uh, independent uh, factors of variation goes through the notion of causality. So uh, in some sense, uh, I should deco uh, decompose the scene and uh, my uh, data in factors that causally generate the observations. 
And that actually is a well-defined notion. You can uh, define formally what you mean by causality. And the reason for that uh, is intrinsically related to the fact that uh, uh, the error of time is a direction. And so there is a formal way of defining uh, which way causality goes. So it's not true that uh, if X and Y are correlated, either Y could cause X or X could cause Y, there is a preferential direction in that, uh, which is a whole other topic uh, to discuss. Uh, the only thing that I will mention about causality is that uh, uh, statistically, it does not have any effect. It can tell me if X cos Y or Y cos X, but it doesn't change their joint probability distribution. So an agent could take other interpretation and be able to do exactly the same predictions about the future without knowing the causal structure of the data. So the causal structure does not make me any more powerful. It may make learning uh, how the data interact easier, but it's not by itself something that is strictly needed in order to solve a task. So I just want to throw that there, but maybe we can discuss it later. And then there was also this other notion discussed in the chat, which is, uh, well, uh, what does it mean information? Of course, uh, the raw data is all the information that they need, but it's not accessible in some sense. So it's uh, there in a very complex way. It's encoded in the correlation between many pixels. I want it to be more easily accessible because I'm an agent and I want to solve things more easily. So there are several notions of, uh, um, uh, how much accessible information is contained in the data. As it was mentioned, the linearly accessible information, how much information a linear decoder can extract from the representation is one. Shannon information is the opposite end, is if I assume I have the most complex possible decoder and I have all the data in the world to train it, how much information would I be able to extract? That is the Shannon information. Uh, in between those two, there is this notion of uh, V information, which says, okay, let's assume that they have a family of decoders and how much information can this family of decoder extract. And so this interpolates between the linear information, my family of decoders, the linear decoders, and the shown information, my family of decoders, all the information. And uh, okay, and in general, th this uh, works and it's interesting to look at. There is now the point of, okay, so what is the right family of decoder? Because uh, should I look only at linear decodability, my brain, I can do things that are much more complex than linear as can the deep neural networks. So where should I stop in increasing the complexity of the data? So that I think it's a, a viable uh, topic of discussion. But I also want to make a counterpoint in just looking at uh, the usefulness of the form just in how much information is accessible to that particular form. And I want to make this point through uh, one practical uh, example of an experiment we did, which is inspired by neuroscience, so this works pretty well <laughs> from the point of view of collaborating with other uh, topics. So it's known that uh, the visual system development in cats is subject to uh, critical learning periods, meaning that if uh, after a, cat, a little kitten is born, you occlude one of the eyes, uh, if you don't remove the occlusions in the first month after birth, then the cat will never be able to learn to use the eye. So even if it has a perfectly functioning eye later on in their life, which you can see, the brain does not actually connect anymore to the eye and it's not able to learn how to process that information. And uh, so there's this critical period of one month after birth where if you change the input to uh, that sensor organ, that you don't learn how to use the sensor organ anymore. Uh, so we were wondering whether this is just an artifact of biology, maybe like there are chemical processes going on with changes over time and change the plasticity of the neurons leading to this. So we try to do the same with deep neural networks so we don't have the same biological constraints. And what you observe is more or less exactly the same. Instead of occluding, we just blurred an image to uh, simulate a cataract, which has a, a similar effect in biology. And uh, 
uh, what happens is that uh, if you blur the images at the beginning of the training of a deep neural network, you make a permanent damage later on in the training, even after you remove the blur. So even if the network later can train on high definition images, it's not able to learn how to use the high definition of the images, the extra information, because at the beginning of the process, we impair the network. So, and so there is this critical period of like 60 epochs of training, which roughly correspond to the critical period of one month after birth of the cat, where changes in that distribution makes permanent damage in learning. So we looked at the why exactly uh, this happens. Uh, and we found uh, this interesting correlation between the critical periods of learning and the information acquired by the network. So here uh, I'm uh, solving a classification task and I'm measuring over time during training how much linearly accessible information the network has about the task itself, which is shown in orange, and about uh, uh, any other uh, uh, nuisance affecting the task, which is shown in blue. So as you can see, at the beginning, I have zero accessible information because my representation is so structured and does not make any information easily accessible. As I progress during training, more and more information becomes linearly accessible. What you observe is that not only the useful information becomes accessible, but also the irrelevant blue information becomes more accessible. At some point later on, however, the network says, hey, wait a minute, why am I encoding all this information that I'm not actually using? And just forgets about that information and gives me a more minimal representation with only encodes of the useful uh, part. However, what happens is that this period where the network is encoding extra information exactly corresponds to the critical learning period where if I change my data distribution, I make a permanent damage to the network. One way to interpret this is that in order to learn a good representation, the network needs to explore much more, needs to consider multiple hypotheses, needs to encode much more information. And after, it has done exploring and it has had time to consider all hypotheses, it can compress and extract only one information or only one solution. Now what happens? If I change my data distribution after this compression has happened, the network does not have plasticity anymore to explore different solutions because it's not encoding enough information to explore more. And so if I change my data distribution later, the network is not able to go back and relearn how to process the data correctly. And this leads to a critical period of learning. So there is this interesting phenomenon that critical periods are not just the biological, but they may actually be something very intrinsic about representation learning which could be uh, justified by this uh, um, too much minimality is bad. And there is a complete orthogonal line of study, which is the lottery ticket hypothesis, so which uh, uh, kind of goes in the same direction, even completely point, different point of view. What the lottery ticket hypothesis says is that uh, the network is very large at the beginning. And after training, basically what happens is that they extract the subnetwork, which works very well to solve the task. Another point is that the subnetwork was there since the beginning. And the only thing that the uh, learning process did was to extract it. And if I directly started with only that subnetwork, then the, the, uh, I would have learned the exact same perfect solution. But the point is that I don't know which subnetwork is the right one. So at the beginning, I need a very large network to give a lot of different hypotheses. And then what the learning does is to select one hypothesis and throw away everything else and to extract the subnetwork and make it stronger and more robust. Uh, so there is this notion that uh, it's not only about encoding what's useful or what is accessible, but sometimes I just need a lot more uh, flexibility for exploration, which is not uh, uh, normally encoded by just looking at the representation, uh, uh, which we think is useful for the task. And so to conclude, uh, uh, I want to make the point that uh, uh, it's dangerous to have a single point of view in representation learning. It's not only what information is important about this data for the task, 
you should uh, we should have a more holistic uh, point of view which looks at the architecture and the structure of the data and the optimization representations are not just about making the information accessible it's also about uh, making the dynamic of the learning process more easy to implement they are also about being compatible with the uh, underlying geometry of the world and the architecture and so i just wanted to raise the controversy that maybe we cannot just talk about the presentation learning and i think that's the uh, last slide no, great thanks a lot um i think we're, we're actually given that we started at about 10 past we're only um five or eight minutes behind so why don't we take now what looks like a 12 minute break? And um, in that time, people can think about the questions that are on the front of their mind for open discussion. And then we'll come back to have that open discussion. Oh, sorry, can you actually post the, the schedule um, for the rest of the workshop? I think that would be helpful for timings. Um, yeah, we can do that. Um, I'll edit the slide, but first I'll just put it in the chat for um, immediate access. So, Richard, what's our restart time? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to put the slide up to say it, but um, okay, I'm great. Struggling with the slides, but um, ten minutes, so so two thirty Eastern. Um, Run through animations could be a moment. Well, I hope everyone has enjoyed the interesting discussion and presentation so far. And uh, now the real discussion begins. There we go. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So great. Now we're going to take this 10 minute break and use it how you will. Um, but uh, hopefully when we come back, everyone will have in mind a, a list of questions um, of the form connections that we've noticed between different fields, um, potential controversies and differences in the way of thinking and uh, blind spots in the way that uh, fields approach these problems. Sounds good. See you all 2.30 Eastern. So uh, to, to kick things off for discussion, um, I want to open up with a question, uh, a high level question that um, what have we lost by starting with a content informed distinction? I want to put that out there. We, we've narrowed our scope from representations to usefulness and from usefulness to content and form. And I wanna just open up, what do people think? Has that been um, a productive distinction and um, what have we missed by doing so? And then we'll get into the actual connections and controversies. And just a reminder out there, if you'd like to join, just raise your hand and we'll uh, invite you up. I think there's there's a challenge associated with recombining things. Like the simplest example that I know that we deal with all the time is, imagine if a, a neuron represents probability. That's something I like to deal with in my research. Uh, what if it actually represented log probability? Can we tell the difference? Well, there's just a simple mapping between the two of them. And so it, if we, if we have you know, a more general version of this, you could have a bunch of variables in the content, a bunch of variables in the form. If there's some transformation of both that would leave everything that we care about intact, um, it, it, may not, it may mean that we've made a mistake in our separation of those two, that essentially what is the content depends on how it is used and how it is used depends on the form. So I worry about that if we're not careful. 
Yeah, I think I'd follow up on that and just say, you know, I, it's it's like a um, convenient way to separate out some issues, but um, I don't think separating them out should make us assume that they're actually independent things that we can always vary independently or that we would want to vary independently in trying to theorize about actual systems. So now we'll hear from somebody who thinks that form and content are totally always separable. Maybe no one thinks that, but I do like the distinction very much. And I think it's overall useful despite possible drawbacks. It's kind of nice to be able to ask independently of the form, what information is kept, what information is present at all, and what information is maybe entirely dropped. And that would be about the content. And that seems a useful uh, thing to slice off and think about somewhat separately, right? And then with the form, we get into somewhat murky issues because we have this problem of multiple interpretability of neural patterns in terms of their, their representational content and the converse problem of multiple realizability of the same abstracts sort or of cognitive functions in neural hardware. And so there is this, um, this indeterminacy there. And I'm not sure how worried we should be about that. My feeling is um, I cannot let go of the concept of representation because it links what is going on in the brain to the world and to function and to cognition. And so we need that. But I also um, uh, find it difficult to embrace a very strong notion of representational realism. So my, my notion is more lightweight because of these indeterminacies, right? So we need this notion of inferential proximity somehow where um, we don't care about trivial transformations like a rotation or change of basis or going from, as Jacques said, from um, the probabilities to the log probabilities. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, but the basic decision uh, distinction between uh, information and form seems useful. However, it might get murky when things become represented at you know very small scales in the representational space where they get uh, just noisy and there's no sort of clear decision that we would like to make conceptually between what information is kept and what information is lost. One thing that, um, that that your transformation argument, you know, your soft representation reminds me of philosophically is that is my red the same as your red, which is you know one of these classic um, questions that people ask. And you know, if everything was just rotated to some degree, you wouldn't be able to tell anything different about it. But the proximity of things, like my red is similar to my orange. And your red is similar to your orange. That is something that we can actually determine. And so I, I actually really like the notion of defining uh, these mappings up to some equivalence class. So the, the intrinsic geometry in units, like in the information geometry sense, in units of the reliability of the, of the representation, for example. So you have some, some variability that is uncontrolled. And that means that you won't be able to distinguish but more than or finer than some resolution. And that can happen at the input side or the output side. And as long as you are able to make the associated map, then you have the information that you need. And that can provide a set of representations, which we could all count as the same. Uh, sort of related to this. <clears throat> uh, so I, I largely agree with the separation between uh, content and form. Uh, just to make the point that it could get markier, uh, there is also that uh, information could be there in the representation, but if it is encoded in a particularly complex way to all uh, effects, it acts as if it were noise. So at that point, uh, what are we going to say? That the representation contained that information, even if uh, from the point of view of the organism, it's just noise, but which I mean that, for example, uh, 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 going to your uh, encoding of the edge orientation. They may be invariant to uh, the intensity of the light, or, but more likely the intensity of the light will add a little bit of noise from which you can reconstruct what was the original intensity. So does that representation now encode the intensity of the light because there is a weak dependence? 
or since it's basically just add the noise that it does not encode. So it's not based on the form, it's not exactly clear what's encoded. So it's good to uh, agree on a good language there, right? So the language that I prefer is to say when the information is present, I would call it encoded, but not represented necessarily. And I would call it represented if it's not only encoded, but also used downstream um, towards successful mm -hmm. behavior in some way. And so, and then there on top of that, there is this functional interpretation, right? That this information is not just there, but it serves the purpose um, of conveying this environmental information to the organism. Yeah, I, I actually uh, agree a lot with that. Uh, I think there are these orthogonal questions of which are not uh, very often uh, uh, discussed is the information which is effectively used, the information which is there in some way and the information which is there in an accessible way. And we often measure uh, the information which is accessible and never the information that is used. Uh, very often, even in machine learning where we could make the difference very clearly. And yeah, uh, so well, I think this would be great to discuss more. And maybe we can take an example like uh, retinal information about mm -hmm. categories of objects, right? The information is there, it's not accessible, but of course it's used, right? And mm -hmm. the decoder is the whole ventral stream. So should it be considered to be represented? Mm -hmm. I would say the category information is represented in the retina but not explicitly other people would say it's not represented in the retina because it only becomes accessible or explicit or inferentially close higher up and then there they would call it represented maybe we should just sort of uh, come to an agreement about the terminology for the purposes of writing about this mm -hmm. i agree and I, i'd also like to point out i think there are two different ideas coming up here um one is this difference between um well the, what you were just talking about nico is is so, somehow how rep representation might have to do with the format the decodability etc um and the other one that i understood alessandro to be saying was the distinction between potential use which is sort of some a statement you can say about you know, I provide some inputs, I look at the representation and I look at the mapping between there and maybe I can say something about disentanglement, I change the color, it changes only one part of the representation. I can do all of these analyses just on like the input or encoding side of things. And that that's a different kind of question potentially than um, asking what happens downstream of the representation. So the, the distinction some of us have talked about in the planning stages of this GAC is a distinction between potential use and actual use, and that these might answer different questions. And I found it really, you know, taking a step back, I found it really interesting that it seems like the majority of what was said by both the, by both Alessandra and by those of us on the neuro um, overview team uh, had seemed to have to do more with potential use, talking about the format of the information in relation to the input and that what primarily came from the philosophy crew seemed to be statements about actual downstream use. Um, That's so, the reverse of what I would have expected. Yeah, so so who, there's a controversy, I guess. Who needs to, uh, who, how do we meet in the middle? Um, maybe I can, I think this is a related kind of question I had that tied to um, some things Alessandro said and, and something in Odilia's slide, which had to do with thinking about usefulness um, from the frame of taking certain properties of the world for granted. And in particular, some of the properties we talked about were 3D objects with translational, translational and rotational invariance. And so my thought was about certain objects where rotation seems to make a very important difference. So I'm thinking just for, for one about a water bottle, when you turn it upside down, its properties are quite different according to how we act on it. And I might think that the first representation my brain got would distinguish between those two cases. And you know, maybe that means you we also need to take gravity for granted, but I could think of probably an example where that would cause a problem for that. Or we could think about my brain being raised in a zero gravity environment. Um, and so thinking about representations that are useful for the agent whose brain it is, um, 
I guess I, I wonder, you know, if before we get to representations that depend on language and depend on a lot of things um, uh, that a late brain comes to acquire, if we don't want to take those sorts of properties about the world for granted in thinking about what the representations are that, that we want to focus on. I think I still don't understand what we're being accused of here in the spirit of friendly adversarialness. So, so what do you mean by actual use? It seems so backwards to accuse philosophers of thinking about actual stuff rather than potential stuff, but just like, what is the thing that we're focused on that neuroscience is not focused on? Uh, yeah, sorry. That, sorry if it came across as too accusatory, but um, in the spirit of being an adversarial, I'll, I'll double down on that. Um, so the kind of statement that um, if I could, hmm, I, 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 yes, okay, let's be extreme about it. If I somehow cut, cut off the sensory system of an agent and look at, you know, what's happening inside the brain and, you know, how that in the absence of any input leads to behavior. Um, I think I get the impression that um, that the sort the sorts of behaviors that arise, quote unquote, downstream of the representation are for many the like sort of the defining feature of what is being represented. Um, as opposed to, I can imagine flipping that and saying, let's let's lesion off the action, right? Let's let's you know sit someone in a chair staring at a screen and they don't have any motor output um, or whatever and focus on how, you know, inputs are encoded into the brain and use something about that relationship as the defining feature of what's being represented. Um, you, you, you still look skeptical about this distinction. Um, yeah, I guess. I would have thought, if anything, that um, that the philosophical tradition has been just as focused on the input side as the neuroscientific one. But I agree that um, in thinking about use, we've thought more about what happens downstream. Um, it, I mean, once you've put it in that extreme way, it seems obvious that we need both to make sense of you know interesting behavior in an environment. And it would be weird for anyone to say that we didn't need both sides. Um, that maybe I'm not quite understanding. Well, well let's, let's ask about. Sorry, I was just going to ask about potential use. Like potential use has a lot of scope. It could be like potentially in the next one millisecond, or it could be potentially in my lifetime, or potentially you know in somewhere in humanity. And so, I, and like, or just theoretically speak. So I don't exactly know what counts as potential use. That might be a, a fruitful thing for other people to define if you have a notion of it. I mean, I, I think Alessandro, you talked about an ensemble of tasks. That's like, <clears throat> we posit a distribution of things that you would be using things for, and then you can specify, ah, well, this is useful for that because it provides information about future value. That makes it very mathematically clear. Um, yeah, but it's also like ensemble I, of tasks is hard. But I, I don't want to make that like uh, my definition necessarily because uh, as I was also saying later, like I may want to encode things that information that maybe I want to use for the task, but may make it easier to learn other stuff, which is actually helpful. So it's more of a blurry line there. Well, I think I think when. You mentioned the distinction between actual and potential use. I find that very inspiring and I haven't thought about it enough. And maybe an interesting point, to me it was very surprising when Rosa said she felt accused because I also felt accused. I was sort of getting ready to justify it from a neuroscientific perspective why we don't uh, you know, evaluate the actual use um, but only think about, you know, how easy, what's the format of this? Could this potentially be used downstream? But I, mean, I was going to say, well, you know, we're studying the sensory system. We can model that, but modeling the whole rest of the brain is hard. And so, you know, give us a break, cut us some slack. You know, we're, we're making some guesses here. Um, but actually, I think the distinction 
is very important, right? So in neuroscience, I think usually when people think it could potentially uh, be used, then that's their way of propping up their argument that they think it's probably used. But we can also think about this in the context of out of distribution generalization, where we might want representations that actually get never used, but could be used um, because every moment of our real life experience in a sense is totally new. And there's always this, um, this, um, this generalization beyond anything we've ever experienced going on, right? Which to me is part of the mystery of, um, of how the brain uh, utilizes experience. Uh, so question uh, about the HRM potential use in neuroscience. So technically you could uh, uh, imagine uh, doing an experiment where uh, you uh, manipulate the encoder. So if you say, uh, if you think that uh, the, uh, the agent is encoding some particular part of the world in a certain way to use it later to go toward food or whatever, you could manipulate this encoding, uh, uh, maybe I'm assuming with some technique uh, to uh, create uh, uh, an artificial signal and see if actually the agent uh, responds to this different encoding by changing its behavior. And that will prove that the agent is actually representing that part of the world uh, in the way you think in the representation, as opposed to uh, passively trying to decode something. And if you're successful saying, okay, the agent is encoding this. Yeah, I, I think it, Yeah, I, I think in neuroscience, um, it, it, I think one theme that came across is that for particular tasks or goals, um, we might be encoding or um, discarding some of the information, but a lot of it seems to be around. And so like for the case um, of where you don't care about contrast and you discount it in one um, instance, and then in another instance, you care about some other property. Um, and I was wondering from a machine learning perspective, what would be like your task ensemble, or maybe from a neural perspective, what would be the task ensemble that would well represent. Um, and in the end, would we end up learning all these nuisance variables because most of them mattered to us, like you were saying, uh, someone was saying, you know, with the grass that you might want to still care about it and, and so on. Uh, yeah, I think from a purely machine learning point of view, at that point, you would have uh, some task which I like, uh, I want to know whether it's darker or lighter, other tasks uh, care only about uh, whether uh, uh, some edge is becoming closer uh, or things like that. And so they care about different things. So, so now if you, in theory, this only means that you should encode both and it doesn't tell you how you should encode both. So, if we add some kind of complexity, complexity constraint, and then we say, okay, we want the representation so that each task can easily access all the information that they need, then it's not anymore, I just need to encode both in some way, but I also need to uh, disentangle them if we want to use that term, meaning that each of them should be linearly accessible and that will make them separate. But so yeah, this is a, it's a, both having a task ensemble and having a complexity constraint on this, which will make the, the behavior of separating them emerge. So I, I'd like to, um, sorry to maybe take a step back, but um, the, because it came up in the chat again, um, I just wanted to point to a concrete, two concrete examples of the actual versus potential distinction that I think um, could make it a little more concrete. The first is um, it came up in the uh, neural content slides. The the story of you know we generally think that area MT of you know primate brain represents motion, and the criteria for saying that are a mix of um, things like it's tuned to motion. So that's something about, you know, the relationship of the input to that. Um, things like, yeah, so it has, has information about the stimulus, but also if you causally perturb these neurons, then it results in changes to the behavior that um, look like the animal misperceived the stimulus in the direction that you, you know, perturbed it. So that, that includes both components of it. 
And the second example I want to call out is um, there's a couple of papers um, in the sort of machine learning disentanglement literature from just a couple of years ago that asked basically, assume we can produce a disentangled representation in some unsupervised learning way, like through an autoencoder. So you take the input, you, you know, compress it down to some vector representation and you, you decode it um, to reconstruct the input and you do it in a way that you put certain disentanglement criteria on that most compressed representation. Like it should have factors that are independent and all of these things. And there are a couple of papers that did this that all of them found negative results on whether or not, on the question of like, was this useful for you know, compositional reasoning in the autoencoder? And the answer was typically no. Even if you do sort of a disentangled encoding that doesn't guarantee that the decoder is going to respect that disentanglement essentially and use it in a way that's compositional. Um, so I think that's a, a concrete example of, you know, if you design a criterion that says, you know, I, I, I want my encoding to have certain properties um, and then sort of leave the downstream decoding of it sort of un relatively unspecified, you know, there's a loss function that's trained by gradient descent, um, but that can lead to certain puzzles like that. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I, I, for me, th this is one of those things where I'm like, I, I'm stuck on it because for me, this was one of my biggest insights from having the, these conversations with everyone leading up to this GAC was just how important it is to think about that the role of the decoder in defining things and making it a simple decoder. And um, yeah, leave it at that. Uh, I can try a little bit of what is my perspective here. Uh, and this is why I wanted to start with a good representation is defined by a task with a perceptibility mechanism, because we know in machine learning that every time we try to force what a good representation is, it never works. So absolutely never. You should always let the network do whatever it wants. <laughs> that is the main lesson of years of deep learning. And uh, so why is that? I don't know. It's kind of upsetting as a researcher that every time you try to help a network, it doesn't actually help. Uh, one thing is, uh, uh, I believe we're starting with a very strong human bias. So uh, in some sense, uh, uh, but please uh, <laughs> feel free to interact here. Um, we, the operating system of our brain is our language. We kind of do everything through language. We do planning, we do inference, we do predictions through some sort of internal monologue. And this uh, uh, encompasses having a very sharp signal to symbol barrier, where in order to have uh, the real world enter our monologue, we kind of need to convert it uh, into this symbol so that we can use and manipulate. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, what basically I see a lot of these disentanglement papers trying to do is to have the network rediscover our symbols. So we have symbols for color, so the network should learn the colors. So we have symbols for sites, and so the network should learn sites. So, uh, this is uh, because we do use them in the context of language and thinking, but the network is not doing that at all. The network is doing linear operation followed by non-linearities on top of this representation. So a symbolic representation is the killer of uh, this, uh, if you have linear operations, maybe you want orthogonality, maybe you want any, you want distributed things, so you don't want uh, symbols. So, so one thing is, okay, there is this human bias. So the counterpoint to the human bias uh, that is given by uh, the more uh, medium description length people or even the causal uh, uh, description people is that, uh, uh, there is a more efficient description of the world, which encompasses these factors. So uh, why do we create a symbol describing an object in space? Well, because that object is going to move around, it's going to create a lot of sensor information, but I can compress all this sensor information by saying there is a put an object in this position, which is moving with the speed. And this is a very efficient compression uh, to explain a lot of uh, uh, in, in sensor information through time. And I, I think that very uh, broadly speaking, a lot of uh, uh, the, the semantic reasoning uh, 
also causal learning is about what is the best way to compress causal learning is basically uh, the causal mechanism is the one that compresses uh, the observation the most. Uh, so if that is true, and it's true also that that would imply better sampling complexity of learning if you learn the right, uh, the right causal mechanism. It's also true that we don't do that as human uh, very often. We just look at correlations and try to create a mental model of uh, how the correlation works and try to do predictions based on this. And as I was mentioning before, uh, causal learning is independent of statistics. Uh, so different, uh, there are different causal explanations from the same correlation, but the only measurable thing is the prediction you do in the future. And so from that point of view, there is no reason why we should do the semantically correct way. We just need uh, to do the statistically correct way, which is not semantic. Uh, and so, yeah, sorry, again, intervent, but uh, that's my way of thinking. So Alessandra, that's, that's really interesting. Can you, I, but I, I, I'm not sure I entirely followed it. So I just have to ask you to clarify. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by, um, uh, first of all, what do you mean by causal? And you said that the causal, I, I forget your exact words, but you said something like finding the causal features maximally uh, compresses it. Right. I, I, uh, could you unpack so, that? Uh, yeah, I, so I'm not an expert in the field and I don't want to misrepresent this. So please take this with a grain of salt, but, uh, uh, so my understanding of the um, uh, caus different causality expansion is that, uh, um, let's see what could be a good example. Uh, and my understanding to just a quick summarize is that you'll have the right latent factors if you have the causal ones. And so you have a minimal representation of the world and that's maximally compressed. And it's not only about the latent, but also about the mechanism, I believe. So for example, uh, uh, Sholkov in his book has this initial uh, uh, example, which is nice that uh, you have rays of light hitting an object, refracting, hitting uh, your eyes and creating an image. So now you have uh, uh, light as uh, one uh, uh, controllable factor, and then you have the random variable image that you receive. And you wonder, is my image that caused the light or is the light that caused my image? It seems trivial, it's still a question we can ask. And the point is that uh, think of changing the light position will change the image in some way. And it's very easy to explain in which way the image will change if I change the light, if I'm going in this direction. But try to go in the opposite direction. Think of uh, uh, saying, I, I change the image and then I want to know how the light should change to justify my change in image. That is a much, much, much more complex uh, uh, um, question. Okay. And, and so-, so I, just, just to see if I'm- Following, I, I think I got thrown by the term compression because uh, in a statistical sense, having a model that says B causes A or A causes B can be equally compressed um, or like the same number of variables. I can, I can have a minimal sufficient representation of both mm -hmm. of those variables. But your point is about the mechanism that connects between yeah. them and saying that, 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 that's a, a low description length in like, Exactly. Like the, that is exactly the point. So okay. you cannot, from the point of view of statistics, uh, describe a causality. That is one of right. the that's, results. That's where I was throwing. So Thanks. one way to introduce causality is to talk about the description length of a program that describes the two different directions. And then you wonder about which one of the programs is shorter, that, that description length. There's also, there's also, just to, to throw this out there, there's also some work that um, on, the, on the topic of usefulness, one of the things that came up was um, forms that are more useful for learning, not just for like computing given the input, but like forms that, you know, help you learn faster or more accurately. And there is certainly some work that suggests getting the causal direction right is a meta learning problem that helps you learn um, on specific problems faster. So um, the, the, the question of getting the right causal forms, or like the, you know, somehow disentangling things into the distinct causal entities is, is useful from that meta-learning perspective also. Uh, yeah, so th there is a little point I think to be made there that uh, 
it's not clear to me how much uh, you cannot also recover from the statistical point of view. Uh, you need to go to the causality point of view in the sense that uh, uh, if I ask uh, what is a sufficient, uh, minimal sufficient description from the point of view of information that explains of the future data, you will still get that there are objects interacting with each other. You don't technically need to talk uh, about causality to get there. It's also the minimum compression of the data from the statistical point of view. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I do believe that uh, minimality from the information point of view is a very good learning principle and is justified by the pack based found, which tells you that uh, uh, minimality guarantees generalization to some degree. So you find me in agreement with that? So Alessandro, a question for your introduction though. It, you, you primarily, it, it seems like a lot of the um, statements you made about, for instance, minimal sufficiency, et cetera, was based on assuming that like test data is by ID the same as the training data. Um, so, and you, you did mention multitask, but I think in the in the context of like yeah. drawing tasks at random or something also by ID. Um, so does your, do some of your statements about minimality, sufficiency and information change in a, you know, correlated and causal world? Okay, that is a, a very good point, which also forces me to retract some of my statements I just did on causality. Uh, so uh, it is true the statistical framework uh, that I described is about to being IID and that the minimal sufficient statistic of the data you find in one setting with some correlations may not hold when the correlation changes because you change your environment. Uh, from that point of view, uh, the causality perspective is that you find the right uh, uh, causal factor that the, the underlying physics of the world will stay constant. So even if the correlation change because it's a different environment and there are different actors at play, the basic interaction between the actors will stay constant. Uh, so that is a robustness uh, to shifting the distribution is one of the causal uh, some points uh, which statistics doesn't have. The statistic counterpoint with this uh, will be, well, if you observe enough uh, environments in the past the minimal sufficient statistic of all this environment together it should still be pretty robust to changes. Um, so yeah, it's always murky. <laughs> Um, I wonder if I kind of spotted a controversy in the chat um, between Rosa and Zach just now. So it was something that was on my mind about thinking about the task, kind of high level task um, on the basis of which we're going to think about representational content as prediction or thinking about it as making causal interventions on the world. And so the kind of example that comes to mind is what if you want to do something that makes things harder to predict, i.e. what if you want to create chaos to some extent, not because it's going to help you learn later, but just because that's a goal of yours. Um, and so, yeah, is it, is it important to distinguish these? Is there a way to collapse one into the other? Um, or is, should we just be thinking about, should we more often be thinking about the task as prediction, or re reconstruction or prediction? Um, or are there particular causal interventions that we really should have our focus on? I think that the um, if if you specify a task, uh, thereby an objective function, then it could be that you know creating chaos is maximizing your objective function. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we we can't get away from anytime we're talking about useful useful for what we need to have some notion of task or task ensemble. Uh, so I think it's always going to show up. Yeah, I agree. And so for me, like getting to the chaos thing and the lack of predictability, like, okay, it's not predictable, but that wasn't part of our goal. Whereas if predictability by itself is our goal, then of course it's going to favor that. And there are some times when our goal is benefiting from predictability. <laughs> 
Uh, just thought that I, I would phrase in that case that uh, your task is predicting the action that you need to make in order to create chaos. So, so it's still a prediction task. It's just that you're not trying to predict the chaos. You're trying to predict the, your course of action. Well, uh, I don't. I I don't usually think of choosing actions as a prediction task, but I might say, can I predict? Um, so maybe you're saying predict the consequence. Uh, Reactions. Sorry, um, maybe uh, let me like um, let's say decision task. So my decision task is uh, to decide the action in order yeah. to maximize some reward, which is a pretty general uh, framework to talk about anything, uh, making decisions. Yeah, I think it would be great to hear hear more from people about the relationship between um, the question of causal models and out of distribution um, generalization, which is uh, a critical challenge, right? And also in the context of the fact that um, different models can be consistent, equally consistent with the joint distribution over experience, but committing to one may have benefits in terms of predicting uh, out of distribution. And uh, as an agent interacting with the world, in a way, this is absolutely essential, not just because the world is complex and the world always changes, but also because we are interacting in a world that actually aims at changing the, our experience and the distributions that we experience, right? So we are always sort of surfing on the cusp of this constant change uh, into a, a essentially, novel future and how that relates to Alessandro's framework, which I find very elegant and compelling, I would like to understand better. I think this is also related to the, the bitter lesson that I'm bringing up in the chat, because the bitter lesson basically says you could put in whatever clever ideas you want, but in the end, you just learn it. These systems do better when they learn. You can't put in anything by hand. And I'm skeptical of that fact. I think that, I mean, I think that we are smarter than that. I think we're making conclusions that are not based on our personal experience. We inherit, you know, uh, our ancestors' experience and they learned and the ones who learned well didn't die uh, and had more babies and then produced us. But ultimately I feel like there must be some clever inductive biases that favor causality or favor other things that are useful and, and learnable. And that is absolutely key to generalization. So I, I can take a stab at answering that question. Um, so the, so, so Judea Pearl likes to distinguish the three different levels of causal reasoning, starting with the statistical level and going to interventional and then to counterfactual. Um, so starting at the rung one, like why is it useful to represent probability to reason statistically. Well, you can make arguments like the Dutch book, like you want to be able to make predictions and not lose money and you know generally behave well in expectation based in decision theory. All of that sort of lives down at rung one. And I think it's relatively straightforward to just generalize that to intervention and say, well, what if I also want to be able to make bets in a world where we're allowed to, you know, go in and manipulate things and intervene on things, then being able to someone who's able to um, reason at rung two interventionally is going to outperform or outbet in the same Dutch book sort of way someone who's only able to make sort of um, who doesn't distinguish different causal directions, right? Um, I think it's a lot more subtle when you get to counterfactuals to ask like why is it useful to represent a mod to sort of yeah to represent causality at the level of queries about the past counterfactuals sort of being defined as what if the past had been different? And it's a little bit more subtle to say why that is useful, especially in, you know, Nika, the way you phrased the question was like making predictions about the future in a never changing world. Um, so how on earth could it be useful to reason about the past? And um, I, I do not, I, and I think there are some empirical demonstrations of this. I'm not aware of any um, theoretical like an analytic demonstrations of it. Um, but what I've convinced myself of at least is that uh, you can make a sample complexity argument for learning and say that 
anytime an agent has a model of the world and this model is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So no, none of us have a perfect simulation. If we, could, if we could close our eyes and perfectly imagine everything that was going to happen to us in the future, then we could run interventions on our mental model and be just as accurate as living our life. So the question of why do we need to retrospect on past information for me is answered by, well, we have an imperfect model. And by reasoning about how the past could have been different, it gives us more, um, it gives us essentially more data. It allows us to elaborate on the data more subtly and more accurately than if we were just reasoning about the future. Sure. Um, and I, so, so I, like, I like that you brought that up, especially because it can all be framed in this usefulness terminology. So maybe getting back to the different definitions of tasks and um, the definitions of inductive biases, I think a very important question is at what level of generality to define these, right? So when uh, Jacques was bringing up the bitter lesson, um, when I read the bitter lesson, it uh, is quite compelling to me. Um, and, but I, initially didn't really get what Jacques was getting at because I would imagine that if you equip your models with the right inductive biases then there's still going to be the bitter lesson and I think this disconnect for me was about the level of abstraction at which we construct these inductive biases right so in for example computational cognitive science there's often a very concrete low level at which um, structure, causal structure of the world is built into models where you have some simulation model that defines your task and that is also part of the inference algorithm. But then there's uh, potentially much more abstract inductive biases. For example, the bias to try to learn a causal model is something much more abstract, right? And similarly with tasks, we can define very concrete tasks where it's about recognizing these particular classes of objects or very abstract and general tasks such as predict video, um, you know, but not frames, but at the level of the latents that emerge in your model with contrastive predictive coding, right? So I think we could describe kind of a hierarchy of levels of abstraction there. And maybe we should have a preference for these more abstract inductive biases that seem to give us a more general kind of insight. I agree with that. And uh, I think that maybe one terminology that we are missing from this discussion at this point could be whether we care about uh, uh, meta information or meta knowledge and meta tasks uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of the counterpoints that we've talked now is that uh, maybe we want this kind of representation of information because uh, it would allow me to get uh, more out of my observations if I have a causal model or it will work better in the future. So this is not strictly uh, information about the data. It's like my meta knowledge of how I'm going to acquire the data. And that is like opens a different level of which maybe it's difficult to put at the same level as like the retinal processing of the image, which is a much lower. Uh, so I don't know if it's useful or not to, to separate them or to keep them united. I'm usually to keep everything united, but in this case, I'm not sure. Uh, I tend to be a lumper myself. Um, I just think about like mapping from all of data history to all of future predictions and actions. Uh, but if you have constraints, computational constraints, learning constraints, all of that, then it can be really useful to separate things according to the mechanisms you're allowed. So I, I'd like to um, change direction uh, a little bit here. Um, and maybe, Nick, you had two questions that you mentioned um, during your uh presentation um one was what is useful for computation and the other one was um how states relate to the world and elaborating on linear decodability would you like to go prioritize either of those or go into them um i guess the discussion we've just been having relates to the linear decodability question um 
so from, so maybe I can try and raise the other topic, which is should we have a should we have an entirely content neutral notion of what useful computations are? Can we just look at a bit of the brain and say, look, it's, this transformation is a we it's a certain useful transformation, or is that only ever relative to the information that these states are carrying? Well, I, I think it's related to your other question uh, because if you want to say something, oh, at the risk of bringing in too, too many other ideas, um, if you want to say something about contentful computation, um, then you have to say something about that content. And if your hypothesis about, or if your method for measuring content is relating to the world through some sort of decoding, then they become related questions. Otherwise, otherwise we enter into the scary territory of how original intentionality comes out of computation. Um, so they seem related. I, I really like that question, Nicholas. Um, and I, one of the things that I really enjoy doing in, in science is trying to find more universal ideas that apply across a wide variety of things. So you can imagine, I, I like, you know, you can imagine that processing sound and processing sight is totally different. There's different spatial resolution, different time scales, smells are totally different. But then there's something shared about all of them, which would be along the lines of causality, along the lines of partial observability, and that those principles uh, would be shared across different brain areas. And so that's the kind of thing that I like to think about. But if you ever want to test it, you got to make it concrete in you know a particular case. So then you have to boil down and say, okay, well, now we're going to do it for vision. What does this weighing of uncertainties actually entail for this task? So I like to think theoretically about the one about the most abstract content free predictions, uh, but then to test them with specific content. Then what does that? So suppose you were just recording from a series of areas um, using the best um, you know, parallel recording devices you could get with whole arrays of data. Do you think you would be able to, uh, um, I, do you think you would find a relatively common computation between the auditory processing and the visual processing? For example, they're both doing um, prediction and, and comparison, you know, so that, that's one framework that would suggest that you will just find a common computation because they're all doing predictive coding. Or do you think- that you're... Says yes. Yeah, so, but it, so to turn this into a controversy, push that far enough and you should be able to identify that in an entirely content neutral way. You just, all you need to assume is that there's, um, that these things carry information in the Shannon sense. You know, so you know, then we're at the, the first page of Shannon that someone was talking about earlier. Where we throw away what the message, is, what what the content of the message is, we're just interested in communication and um, getting some information from one place to another, and then doing computations on it. And you would look at what was going on in the auditory stream and the visual stream and the tactile stream as instances of the same kind of computation. And then we wouldn't need this notion of content to really get at what the brain's doing, because what we're trying to get at is the common computational principle. I would like to do that. But I think the problem in doing so is that there are so many nuisance variables that show up differently. And so to extract the shared part in those different sensory modalities is much, much more difficult. And I would probably hazard to say impossible without also accounting for the content. Right. So that's very, very useful because that goes back to that. So is it, is it a metaphysical or an epistemic matter? So you're saying epistemically, we'll never be able to work out what computations are being performed because so much of what's going on in there is nuisance variables. We need to see how this is wired up to the world to work out what the nuisance variables are. Then we can look at what aspects of the neural activity are non-nuisance variables. And then if we see how those are transformed during the computations, then we'll see what the computation is. And that's the thing that might be shared. So that's a mere, I mean, that's a merely epistemic matter, if that's right. So it might be that um, we can get a content-free notion of the computations, um, but in order to find out what it is, we need to look at how these things connect up to the world. And that's a very different perspective to the one that Nico was offering us, where um, we really do need the notion of content to connect to 
the cognitive level that will tell us what the what you know what the brain's actually doing. I think that between vision and audition, there's been a lot of cross um, borrowing of computational principles and ideas to get at common um, ideas, at least in terms of information, in terms of. Um, um, so I, I think at least between those two areas, there's been a lot of crosstalk. Um, there might be different types. So you know, these are cl maybe closer sensory ways of looking at things, but for other problems, it might be more complicated. Um, but at least the concepts themselves have been borrowed from one to another. So, uh, can I ask a clarification question to the neuroscience people uh, on this topic? So when we say uh, unifying computational principles, so what I would have expected from a neuroscience and what I expect from neural networks is that uh, it's not really about uh, one single principle. It's more like the network is doing a lot of pretty random stuff. Some of them seems useful in some uh, human semantic sense. And then they're just ensembling everything to get a solution that is pretty much robust and always works. So I was thinking of the brain more as like a bag of tricks of different things I can do with the data, which in the end gives me the right answer. Uh, are you suggesting that uh, it's actually more about having a real uh, clear principle just implemented in uh, different ways instead? I think this is super controversial, but I like, yes, I think this is a huge question. I'd be very curious what other people here think. Yeah, it's attractive to, when we talk about representation, there is the implication that they get transformed in some way, and that's the computation, right? And in this workshop, by virtue of the title, we're focusing on one part of the problem, and we're kind of ignoring the other part. And of course, the the to interact, right? And in some contexts, we can get away with thinking mainly about representations. And in other contexts, we want to think about useful computations that are more general. And this might also vary, or our intuitions and the implementation might vary depending on what brain region we're in and what the computational challenges are. For example, when we think of the visual system, the auditory system, and as Odelia said, there are some common principles computationally. We'd probably, I think most neuroscientists probably have the intuition that these are independently discovered by these two systems through some combination of um, evolution and ontogenetic learning. Uh, there, maybe there are common principles, but they're independently discovered, right? But to what extent can we also have a higher level of perhaps cognitive um, representation, which might benefit massively for, um, uh, from, from discovering computational principles that can be applied to all kinds of content, right? And then we have a more sort of purely, uh, more flexible and cognitive view of the mind, which cognitive scientists uh, are, have been studying for a long time. And so the earlier discussion about inferring causes, that would be a candidate for a more general computational principle to be meaningful. Maybe there's a question relatively domain way yeah. general way of extracting the causal variables, and that might be something that's implemented in lots of Yeah, I think that's the hard part, because you could say, well, let's take a bag of tricks and we'll train it and it will automatically discover the causes eventually, because if you didn't, it would like, you know, be pruned away or die or something. Uh, then there's the more directed version of that, which says that we actually have a mechanism, maybe the microcircuit or maybe the release of certain neurotransmitters when we take actions that actually facilitate the discovery of causal things. It's not a bag of tricks, that there are specific common tricks. I tend to favor the latter, and I'm really interested in only the latter, like only not bag of tricks, but principles. Because otherwise, you know, it's just a random, a random thing with little to understand. Um, but if there's something that's like a learning rule, which is just trying lots of stuff, then you could say that, well, that's the, that's the shared principle. Just try lots of stuff, get more data, and that's your principle. It's a pretty simple principle. Personally, I think that there's maybe a whole spectrum in between there where you can find the results the consequences of a lifetime of learning in the structures in the brain. So you've learned in a structured world, that structure is imported into the brain, and then you can see 
what it what it has done in the end, but how it got there, it might have taken you know a bunch of clever learning rules. So all of this is also interesting to consider in the context of the history of AI, right? Where in the beginning, there was the idea of these very general algorithms and then the realization they all have exponential time complexity and we need a lot of knowledge in the system. And that goes in the direction of more of a bag of tricks and function approximation with neural networks certainly is uh, can be seen in that tradition. But there's also um, the beautiful the grand Bayesian integration, which kind of separates the computational general principle from the knowledge that you also need, right? So you need the capacity for the knowledge, and then you have this separation between these two. And I still find this a very attractive framework also for thinking about the brain. I'd like to return to um, the comment about understanding both like representations and computation sort of jointly to paraphrase understanding computation maybe as transformation of representation um and just volunteer that some, I, I just realized for myself that the way that i've always thought about that is primarily in terms of uh potential rather than actual computation if that makes sense so um, to, to give an example, um, you know, it, it, from computer science, you know, it, it takes n log n time to sort a list. Um, that's a statement about, you know, you give me a list of numbers, that's a particular kind of representation, and I'd like to pass it through some computation and get out a sorted list of numbers. So that's a transformation from one to another that goes through some stages. And the statement that that's sort of an n log n operation is a best case potential statement. Um, and I think I've always applied similar logic um, to neural representations, which is, I, you know, in order to understand what this vector representation of neurons is doing, I need to know something about what kinds of computations are available to me. I need to know something about the hardware, like what is decodable. Um, but that is potentially a different question than actually looking at the transformation itself. And that, that to me is, is what I, I mean, I went there thinking about this question of like the general principles of computation being like, what are the set of things that are available to me? What, what can you do with one layer of a neural network? That's the kind of thing that I can, you know, maybe do in a single computational operation, um, which is, yeah, different potentially from it, Maybe you agree or disagree with this mapping, but the comment about bag of tricks to me was a comment about, yes, but it's realized in different ways in different areas, but there might still be a, a core potential of set of things that could be implemented. I just wanted to push back a little on it's important to see what computations are available to me. Uh, th that was the view in early uh, deep learning. Uh, so everyone was going about, uh, well, deep networks are better because they're more expressive than shallow network uh, and so forth and so on. Now, it was discovered that that was not the case at all. You can uh, create a shallow network which is as good as the deep network. The problem is that you cannot train the shallow network to do that. Uh, so in some sense, uh, deep networks uh, are more expressive, but what makes them work is that they're more trainable, the dynamics of learning are better. So it's not really uh, about what computations are available to me, it's what computations are accessible to me through normal learning, uh, through normal data. So for me, one um, when we work on statistical models, like the one I showed, like the Gaussian scale mixture, one nice property is that the goal sets what the computation is. So you end up getting something like gain control from your goal, but it's a, you know, it's a statistical model that's in some sense much more simpler than putting a bunch, you know, many layers stacked together. And so in deep neural networks, it, it feels like you put a lot of layers together, you do some smart things, like you, you have the convolutions and you have um, the in invariances that you get through the deep neural network, but to some degree, the computation 
um, does not come out of the goal. You build it in, and then and then you get the computation. And I, in that respect, um, I'm also wondering. Like, I've been interested in early visual cortex, for example. You can explain a lot of things from the perspective of this normalization, but it could be that deep networks can still approximate some of these behaviors. Indeed, we get you know some match to um, neural representations in that way. I, my uh, the, all of this stuff with learning, like you have universal function approximators, you can learn these things, that things. The problem is always that the test is really a generalization test. And that is not something that you're learning. It's just something you've learned and you see what happens next. It's extrapolation. And so all of the interesting stuff is going to be what structure ends up kind of accidentally learning the next thing being correct. Yeah. And I think we kind of have uh, some partial answer to that. I mean, very partial, very high level, but uh, uh, so we said that if we believe that uh, minimality of the representation uh, uh, leads to better generalization because of the generalization bounds that you can prove, uh, then it becomes interesting because, okay, so what gives a minimal representation? Well, the noise, uh, it's a bound on the information that you can store. Uh, so if minimality leads to generalization and your uh, computational algorithm is noisy, Naturally, your computational algorithm should generalize better, which I, I guess it was one in the point in the slide, uh, noise leads to robustness that leads to generalization. Um, there is also the point of view that uh, uh, if your uh, uh, computational techniques is easier, uh, then it's a more restricted function class and then it's more minimal and then it should generalize better and so on. So I think that it's a universal principle that can be implemented in different ways and tend to recur in learning. Maybe on that, the, the minimality, I think, uh, it seems to me that that should be very easy to break by uh, out of distribution challenges. So for example, you might learn, uh, you might have, you know, a hundred different features that can easily do, do the task uh, on your training set, but uh, only 10 of them are the, the true features that define the categories that would hold up over, you know, future data sets that you might get, right? It seems desirable for the model to keep those, hypotheses in the set, so to speak, right? To have the rich, the richest possible hypothesis set. So in, from a Bayesian perspective, just to not pretend that you can eliminate possibilities that you actually have no evidence against, right? And that, so how does that tie in with the minimality principle when you, um, I mean, it's the IID assumption, right? That's problematic here. So, uh... I agree. So I, I usually believe uh, in, in a greedy process. Uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, learning agents uh, are, uh, I mean, unless they're humans and they have uh, all these extra things attached, uh, I don't believe uh, learning uh, agents necessarily think that much in the future. They just want really to get the present working. And so I guess that. Uh, uh, what I showed about the uh, useless and useful information uh, over time, uh, like the, the hypothesis that could put forward is that the agent tend to have this exploratory phase where they encode a lot of different features because they don't yet know what is going to be helpful. And then at some point they want to uh, drop them uh, in order to get a more minimal uh, uh, hypothesis and get a better generalization out of it, which would fit well uh, with the uh, initial learning phase uh, of most animal uh, followed by a pretty static phase in which you don't uh, change your presentation much more. Uh, so yeah, and in general, uh, then I could mirror the question to neuroscientists. So do we have any evidence of that any animal, uh, or humans maybe, uh, mm, factors the learning so that is compatible with future possibly unseen environments or do they just overfit to the current environment? Mm -hmm. 
I wish we had more, more cognitive uh, scientists here. Uh, this is the first time I would passionately disagree with what you said about you know, how humans go to the, through the world. I think humans go through the world being interested in all kinds of regularities and dependencies and always trying to predict. And if something is really unexpected, this worries us deeply, even though it's totally irrelevant to any task that we, we have to achieve. So, you know, my, my intuition is that um, it, it, there's probably examples in the literature, um, and we should go back to that for, for the paper, but it, it should be very easy to demonstrate that people automatically do that, even when the task does not require it, it will then uh, generalize much better than an agent that learns a minimal representation and therefore eliminates lots of features that could turn out to be useful for a, a different uh, distribution of a similar task or the same task. Okay, I agree, but then let me rephrase uh, the question. Uh, I, I would see curiosity as being a, a task on its own, uh, which may be hard-coded by genetic, uh, exactly to avoid us uh, minimizing too much. So maybe the question is more, uh, is there any low level mechanism uh, in the brain uh, that uh, tries to keep the hypothesis open or did we have to invent curiosity in order not to minimize too much as an additional uh, mechanism? We have one audience question. Um, Ari, would you wanna say it out loud or have us ask it? Hi, um, I can say it out loud. Um, so uh, I guess it's a, it's, it's a question in two parts, but the first, um, it, there seems to be a, a really uh, a amazing amount of agreement that usability is something that's important for our presentations. So one of the things, uh, and I guess that's not you know, universally held in uh, neuroscience or um, other disciplines, but uh, I guess I, I wanna emphasize whether um, like, uh, like, like first, uh, does this panel agree that usability is not something that's just important, but actually a defining characteristic of what we call a representation? Um, and, uh, maybe that would be enough of a question. Um, but my, my, my latter question about that. So if we do think that usability, a, a, like say, uh, linear decodability is a qualification, is the panel comfortable with representation not just being something like this either does or this does not represent the external, like whether there's a tree there, but rather representations being some sort of continuum of representation in this overlaying on top of uh, information? I think uh, I have a short answer, which is um, for me, if, if you had asked me maybe a few months ago before going into all of this, I would have said, yes, usability is a defining feature. And I would pivot now to say, actual use is the defining feature and usability is a component of that. So um, I think right. Paige is what Richard said there at the end, but I would just add, I hadn't thought about that. The, I guess for me, there's still an interesting question about um, representations that were, so, so rejecting the kind of spectrum discussion. So you can find all sorts of things that are linearly decodable and there's still a further question about what's actually this, yeah, ties, ties to actual use. So something that the agent or the user, however conceived is using being essential to whether we should call it a representation at all or whether we should call it usable information that if the rep if the agent were designed differently or if such and such were the case, then we would think it's represented or is a vehicle for a representation, but that's me. Rosa? Um, so I, I mean, I don't think this is a view that lots of people would agree with, but it seems to me pretty reasonable to talk in terms of how, um, how apt it is to call something a representation or how useful the representational characterization is. And it seems like that is a thing that could come in degrees 
even if you think, um, you know, once you've decided that it is useful, um, then there's a fact of the matter about whether um, whether something is a representation or not, given what you want to explain. Yeah, I would say usability is definitely a requirement and actual use is also a requirement. And I would distinguish that from something that um, seemed to be a little bit conflated with that in, in your question, which is accessibility, right? So it could be that some information is used downstream, but not in the next step. So it's usable and actually used downstream, but it's not necessarily explicit. Um, but I mean, there are some semantic issues here where I think we just have to agree on a terminology of what we mean by, um, by representation and whether we use the term explicit representation or accessible representation um, in addition to that. I'm not sure who had their hand up next to me. Maybe. I think Erika. Yeah, I guess, um, because I guess you're about to move on, I, I wanted to step in and, and I, I think it's been a fascinating discussion, but there seems to be one other element of the, I guess, debate from a philosophical perspective to bring in, which is we have the perspective of representations in the system, the agent, which we've been describing with respect to information in the environment, uh, constraints on the agent's resources, et cetera, uh, the computations, the objective function. But there's also this perspective of we, the scientists, uh, observing the agent and trying to create, uh, in this case, you know, looking at humans or mice, um, a structured understanding that may allow us to do future scientific investigation. So, so one way of interpreting, I think, some of what Zach was saying is that regardless of whether, you know, the way we're going to think about the things that get found by a set of learning rules that operate on, you know, evolutionary and local time scales is something very, very complicated. Perhaps from the perspective of the way we think about the problem locally, there may be, you know, regularities, representations that we want to think about um, that reflect sort of kinds of computations that we want to think about because it's useful for us in understanding the system. I guess in some sense I'm thinking this is something like a, a projection problem where you're discarding some of the things that the brain is dealing with as nuisance variables. It's sort of why we create experiments. Um, we're narrowing things down, but I don't know. I, I, I wasn't able to formulate this question in as precise a way I wanted, but does this make some sense, the kind of thing I'm asking about, which is you know, is the representation something that we can only think about internal to the system and re with respect to, you know, whatever its physical causal structure is, or is it also something that we need to think about as we describe the system or how we represent it? Uh, Eric, are you asking, like, is this something that we find useful as scientists and people, but is not objectively there? That it's yeah, like I think that's, that's the tension I'm trying to get at, which is to say, you know, it seems like the, we're trying to make a hard edge distinction in some of these elements here as to whether it is or isn't, but it seems like it could be the case that it's there in some sense because we can uh, identify something that's useful for us to describe. It's some, they say, lower dimensional representation of what's going on in the system. May not have all of the qualities that, that have been discussed here, but somehow it's actually useful for us in terms of understanding the system, moving science forward, etc. Does that make sense? Philosophical question, probably as much as a practical one. I mean, this is this because she agrees with you. I guess I was going to just add some flesh on what I said before, which I think goes right to this, which is that um, my thought was that it, or like I would hope to agree on a certain explanatory aim of understanding if individual agents autonomously moving through the world and how they do that and how they do that depending on representations. And given that agreed upon aim, um, that constrains how we should represent those representations. It constrains that we should appeal to how those agents actually use those representations in order for us to represent them to each other and avoid um, ways of talking about what the brain carries information about that might be useful for us to represent in other contexts, but aren't useful for 
understanding how those agents move through the world and, and achieve their goals and whatever. So we might not actually agree on that broader explanatory aim and then other notions of representation would be more appropriate. But that was my that was what was motivating my um, sort of cutoff way I described uh, that aim. Was Andrew going to say something? Um, yeah, I was maybe going to, but then it's, I mean, it's sort of exactly the opposite of what Ben was saying. But I was going to say that there's a sense, Eric, in which the question about how we describe the brain as representing is the only important thing. Because if describing the brain in representational terms is everything you said, if it's useful and it gives us good uh, models and it pushes science forward and so on, uh, those are the goals, right? Uh, and so then we can treat rep the notion of representation in a very deflationary or anti-realist way. Uh, and it doesn't seem to have much bearing as long as treating it in that deflationary or anti-realist way doesn't keep it from achieving those goals of modeling and pushing science forward and so on. So I think if we do want to talk about the brain as actually representing, it's actually representing or uh, whatever the other side of this is, has to have some bearing on those explanatory questions and has to have some beard bearing on the way it pushes science forward and so on. I guess science, the aim, so uh, I guess I want to fill in that aim. So pushing science forward, useful, useful for what? What does it mean to understand agents and to have more science, better science of how the agents are behaving? My thought to put it in another terms would be being anti-realist or deflationary about what the user is. That's something we agree on. And um, beneath that, we'll we'll sort of be forced to agree on what the representations are, but it's derived from a like higher order anti-realist position or deflationary position. Um, I'm not sure if that comes through clearly, but I mean, I guess one simple way of describing this is is like with reference to the bitter lesson that, that you know Zach posted, it, this idea that you know let's imagine we take a system that we have only one concept, which is that I don't know it it, it does uh, some generic learning, some generalized learning process. I don't know as Ralph was saying earlier, we just set up some Bayesian uh, cost function and, and inference system, and then at the end we have a black box. Um, I guess my question in some sense is from the standpoint of the way I think about doing science that does have one principle that was useful, which is sort of understanding whatever that generalized learning process was. Um, but then it it's done like it we're stuck right there's nothing more and so, in some sense, I guess the question is maybe, even though now we get into a, a gray area there's reasons for us to want to not argue about exactly what representations and computations are within that system from some realist perspective but from this perspective of usability utility we actually do want to look for things that we can think of as representations and, and the computations they're operating on because they give us a way of trying to understand the system and so and it's going to be an approximation it's going to be imperfect and worrying about whether it is or isn't may not be the right worry. I guess that was what I was just curious about the perspective on here. I'm a little confused now about usability from the researcher's perspective versus from the brain's perspective. Is that just me? I'm torn because that is a very interesting question that I was hoping to get to, but I also think in the interest of time, we, we ought to switch to the next section of the workshop. Um, so uh, apologies about that, but um, so we've had a very good high level discussion about a lot of interesting things. Um, so in an effort to conclude this workshop, um, 
we wanted to end on uh, basically, yeah, sketching, sketching next steps. How concrete can we be about, you know, what we've learned and ways in which it can be applied, things that, you know, it, it, yeah, so, so what, what have people found particularly interesting and that they're excited about doing next? Um, and can I, can I chip in on that? So, um, I thought there was a very interesting con controversy that showed up in various guises. Um, so one example is um, Alessandro on one side and uh, neuroscience people on the other side um, about how so the one view is that the representations that emerge come from um, some broadly information theoretic kind of process, um, learning and um, minimal representations or throwing a bag of tricks at, at the data and getting something that way. Um, and another, the other perspective is that there's some relatively general thing that's going on in the, or a small set of things that are going on in the brain, especially causality and curiosity, where curiosity might be broadly useful, you know, maybe evolution has told us it's useful, but it's not tied to um, any of the tasks that you're learning at the, at, at the time. And those seem to be very different perspectives as to what the processes are that will lead to the representations. That might lead to a different picture of what the representations are. And I think the neuroscience perspective kind of underpins what Nico keeps coming back to in the chat about um, why is it I'm, although I think use is important, why, is I, why am I analyzing in a way that only looks at um, usability? I mean, so maybe if you've got this much higher, higher level perspective and curiosity or finding the causal variables is, is um, what the brain's going in for, then the usable um, and the use, the used can't end up being very close together because it's the, the usable with respect to the task of curiosity or with respect to the task of causal inference, um, then they're actually being used. So I, I wonder if that, that controversy that showed up in a couple of forms would give us something that we could drill down into and have actually write about different perspectives on. Um, uh, what is the brain a, a bag of tricks that's learning whatever representations work for the set of tasks that's given? Or is it working with some high level principles um, that extract, um, uh, the rep extract representations? And the, when we're doing neuroscience, we're working with a kind of tacit knowledge of what those are. And that's why we have various ways of analyzing the data to get in what the representations are. I fully agree that that is a very interesting controversy that we should totally discuss. And uh, as a subset of that, uh, I think that what emerged uh, is also uh, this finer distinction between uh, information that is there, that is useful, that is accessible, that is learnable, and so on, which uh, is frequently glossed over, but is seen that is very important in defining properly what a representation is. So maybe that could be another topic of debate uh, on itself. Yeah, that would be a useful angle. So philosophers like doing that kind of thing, is like trying to make all these distinctions clear in order to set up something that is a genuine uh, controversy rather than people talking past each other using different definitions of these things. Yeah, I agree. I, I, we, could, we could make a lot of progress by defining the terminology very clearly, then articulating the consensus on a lot of points actually that are very subtle. And I'm super excited about this discussion because it really stretches my imagination and shows me my, my blind spots. And so I would be very excited about writing something together that sort of summarizes uh, the coherent perspective that we can formulate. And then maybe there could be um, a second part. The next step would then to be to what, what Nick was talking about, to articulate remaining substantial differences that are not semantic, but that are uh, substantial. And that would be very exciting. And whether we can then also go in the direction of outlining possible experiments or ways to resolve them with the methods of neuroscience, philosophy, or machine learning, um, maybe that would be that would be very good. But we haven't made so much progress toward that yet. But maybe that should be like the next step. Yeah, that that's a good point. So that there's two next steps that we're talking about here. One is what do we write as a as a group um, 
in this you know paper that's been invited by CCN. And the second question is, yes, that that paper itself can contain calls for future work that is uh, concrete, you know, research that that's going to be interesting. Um, both of which are on the table for discussion right now. So what, one thing I wanted to throw out was, um, I think there's been a lot of excitement about um, uh, this, this quant quantifiable usable information, like these different methods for quantifying what is usable that sort of goes beyond linearity and not all the way to you know, problems that come with like Shannon information. Um, and so to, uh, I, I've been entertaining two um, applications of this. One is towards what Nick brought up on the definition of computation. Um, so if, if there's something productive to be said about what philosophically counts as computation um, on your know, manipulation of certain representations, if that can take into account somehow this notion of low complexity decoding, I think that could be potentially really interesting. Um, and similarly, I've been entertaining ideas about um, the geometric methods that we heard about, um, especially from Nico in, in the neuroscience uh, section. Basically, the, the, to gloss that again, knowing how similar different points are in neural space tells you something about um, something about representational content potentially. And that perhaps by elaborating on what, perhaps we can apply the tools of, you know, usable or decodable information to elaborate on what it means for different activity patterns to be similar or not. And that that could potentially lead to um, interesting ways of combining these different ideas. So maybe just to prompt getting a little bit more refined on one of these, um, we, Richard just brought up information that is quantifiably usable in some way that goes beyond methods that we have. And um, Alessandro mentioned a few things, usable what was one of them, learnable, accessible. So am I leaving something out in those three? What are these things we'd like to clearly distinguish before we get into the more major controversy that um, you know we may just leave as a controversy? And I think the notion of usable and learnable is potentially like learnable is a subset of usable. It's like usable for you know, on what time scale by what mechanism. And my concern, like we can define that as an important principle, but my concern is that it's very hard to say anything concrete about it because it all depends on what constraints you have. And those constraints are really complicated and so far unknown. And the key distinction would be usable in the next step or usable downstream at some point, right? So that is very different, right? So in that sense, it's, it makes sense to be interested in the information content more broadly, not just the explicit information content, because at some point downstream, it is potentially usable. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with that. And I think that that's a, an important distinction between <clears throat> usable now I, either in like the activity that happens later or the, the output of a behavior that happens like in now or changing the internal state of a system now, like, you know, updating a plasticity rule or using the plasticity rule versus potentially useful in some time in the future. But if it's potentially useful in the future and you're going to keep, you're going to represent it, it means that you have to modify something about the internal state of the system now, like changing the synaptic weight or storing something in memory. So I think it really, even in either case, it ends up being like, if it's, if it's useful in the future, it has to be used now somehow. 
and the notion of what is useful in the future, like the connection between what you what is potentially useful in the future and what do you learn, that's going to depend on the constraints again. So I don't know, I mean, I think it is useful to talk about what is useful <laughs> and what is potentially useful. Uh, but I think that you know those they're not as cleanly separated as we might hope. Just to cap, we've got four things there, have we got? We've got usable, which might include potentially useful. We've got learnable, which is a difficult subset of the usable. We've got actually used. And then we've got something, then we've got accessible. That was also in the list, is that right? As, uh, yeah, as I use the word accessible. Well, I don't need the word accessible in there. I think it's the same as like usable. But it's a, that's a specifically uh, decoding notion, accessible, though, isn't it? Or immediately decodable. Yeah, well, exactly, Jacques. Um, I mean, you're talking about far in time, but what about downstream, right? So I think this distinction between usable, for example, in the same situation, like a second later or a fraction of a second later, but after 10 nonlinearities, you know, should be different from accessible in the sense of linearly decodable, right? So you might have something that you can't linearly decode, but that the, the, the organism is clearly using, but there are just more nonlinearities, right? So maybe we can have different factors like actual use, potential use, and then immediate use. So it's sort of inferentially proximal and it's used like locally in the computational process or eventual use, right? And you could have learnability for these separately. Yeah, I mean, I, I would still lump together the notion of usable downstream as usable immediately subject to constraints. But it might be like, I guess I would, I would put it under that broad umbrella. And then I would say, okay, the constraints are structured in the brain such that there are often layers and nonlinearities that, that give us additional um, ways of thinking about what is accessible by one layer or accessible by the mechanisms that are locally connected. I think now we're starting to write. We probably have to hack this out um, in comments of a document. Yeah, I mean, uh, Richard, do you have that document open? The, there was some yeah. like, it was, you were putting in like comments from the chat and stuff like that. This might be, I don't know, a good place yeah, to I, eventually just transfer some of these ideas. I'm, I'm attempting to keep up alive right now. We'll see. Impressive, Impressive Richard. I guess something else we discussed uh, is this uh, uh, necessity of having some causal representation. I suppose there's a purely statistical mm -hmm. representation. Um, then uh, I'm just <laughs> uh, listing everything that comes to mind. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about this, but this is popular, so maybe we want to still think about it. Uh, the, let's say, signal to symbol barrier, whether it's necessary or desirable that the representation becomes more symbolic rather than being uh, some continuous vector representing the data. Yeah, that's a fun controversy. There's a can of worms in there. <laughs> I mean, even when you have, um, even when you have a continuous variable, if you have limited reliability with your representation, you're going to have noise, and that noise is going to create what is effectively a resolution, or you can treat it like a quantum or a bin. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's not clear to me that it is ultimately like we'll be able to get away from categorical in that sense. But at the same time, the resolution that we could produce, you know, might might have you know a hundred or a thousand bins in principle, but the ones that we actually do produce only have two big chunks. Right, like binary or some really cat much coarser categorical thing than our than our apparatus could uh, support. <laughs> 
so I, I think we can uh, agree on uh, uh, the fact that like you can discretize the quantize the continuous thing. Uh, maybe it's the more controversial part is the necessity of uh, operate on symbol in a, a symbolic deduction matter, like the good old AI uh, of the 60s. So you would have symbols and the logical inference of them. Is that something desirable for an agent? Because it doesn't seem to happen naturally in most of the learning agents. It just happens to uh, maybe humans. And uh, so it is that. And then also maybe related to that, uh, I was wondering, uh, um, we, at some point we said uh, it would be nice to have uh, a unified principle that allows us to reuse the same computational mechanism uh, along, among different modalities. And I was thinking uh, actually what humans do with language uh, is kind of that. Uh, once we map everything to the language, we can use the same inference mechanism to reason about sounds and to reason about the vision and so on. So, um, I don't know if that is of interest, but uh, there could be the discussion of whether uh, uh, we evolve the language uh, to have a better way of sharing a processing thing between modalities. So I've also been taking notes here and um, hopefully between Richard and I, uh, we won't leave anything out too major. And you can expect some follow up communication with us. We'll put together a document that we can all start talking on. Um, we are at time here and um, appreciate you all very much for, for being a part of this. And this has been an awesome discussion for me. I've learned a lot. Um, so, yeah, with that, we should wrap up this. Uh, I, maybe I should hand this back to Eric in case there's any fin final notes um, that CCN broadly wants to say. Um, but other than that, Thanks a lot, and uh, I'll talk to you offline. Thank you, Thank you guys, um, and thank all the, I guess uh, we have about seven attendees left today at this hour. Um, it was a long and interesting discussion, but uh, it's kind of, I guess, the goal that we had to have these open debates for people to be able to uh, participate in. If not now, they can watch it and, and uh, provide feedback in the future. So uh, with that, this is the end of the CCN uh, virtual conference for 2021. And we'll look forward to hearing the updates from your GAC and all of the other GACs uh, in 2022. So until then, thank you and good night.